Hey everyone, Grayson here with a small correction before the debate starts. At one point, my opponent claims that there aren't any businesses that will radiometrically date samples for public customers. And at the time, I didn't know about any radiometric dating businesses, so I just granted it and moved the conversation forward. But it turns out there are quite a lot of businesses that do just that. A cursory Google search after the debate revealed multiple. It wasn't hard to find. So that's my bad. I'm happy to take the L on that one. I should have been more skeptical of his claims there. Anyway, it doesn't change the fact that radiometric dating is accurate and reliable and entirely precludes the young earth creationist global flood. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, we are going to be debating, did the flood of Noah happen? And to get us started out, we have evidence of God. You have 10 minutes on the floor. Thank you so much for being here, evidence of God. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> All righty. <clears throat> uh, there's overwhelming evidence to support the Bible is truth. The global flood is one of many stories in the Bible that's supported by mountains of evidence. Genesis 6, 3, the Lord said, My spirit will not always abide with man, for he is flesh. His life will be 120. According to the Bible, in Noah's day, organisms lived much longer. According to many scientists, higher oxygen levels may be associated with longevity. We're far from understanding the implications of different atmospheric makeups on the human body, but there's much promising results regarding oxygen, cell regeneration, immunity to diseases, illnesses, ailments, higher endurance, and more energy conversion. Species like sea turtles are able to live extremely long lives, greatly attributed to their ability to regulate their oxygen. In high and low oxygen atmospheres, more efficient metabolisms and energy conversion, despite all the enormous predators, they're reflected throughout the fossil records. Not only is this an example of how oxygen affects lifespans, growth, and adaptations in the genetic coding, but it's a perfect representation of a creature that would be a perfect candidate to survive the floods and its after effects, yet no reason to assume they would survive a mass extinction of the dinosaurs or even be a candidate to survive the predators it supposedly contended with. Genesis 7.22, all that was on dry land died. The dinosaur mass extinction exterminated the land creatures. The one that the ones that did the creatures that did remain from after the flood played an important role in telling us about the atmospheric changes that occurred regarding the global event that fossilized them in the water and left only selected creatures alive that are capable of evading the flood. On potential land masses, underground ecosystems were on the ark, and in the water, like the insects and some small rodents and marsupials, which in many cases are adapted to aquatic life and living close to the water. Turtles, alligators, lung lungfish, colacanth, sharks, rays, frogs, and salamanders. These creatures all share a commonality of their ability to, ability to regulate oxygen and survive through dramatic changes to the environment, and specifically oxygen changes in the air and water. They all began decreasing size post-global flood event. As the Bible describes the post-flood, the ages and sizes began to decrease rapidly. The animals that came off the ark were all suited to adapt to changing environments. Those that were not went extinct. Due to current climate change, including ecosystems that produce oxygen being affected and destroyed, scientists have been observing changes in many creatures. Birds are getting smaller bodies and larger wingspans. Many insects and reptiles and other creatures are getting smaller in these very short time frames, thus showing a type of macroevolution not in line with the millions of years, but mere decades. This is what the biblical time frame predicts since the flood. Regarding speciation changes and variety, this is what we observe and the evidence supports. Like Darwin's finches, the genetic coding is responsible for these adaptations in relatively short time frames. Thanks to man's attempt to destroy the earth again this time, we're seeing the biblical narrative play out in front of us, making it much easier to comprehend how a variety of species adapted to environments and ecosystems so rapidly since the flood. We see the Bible is correct, and these land creatures disappeared. The fossil record shows changes to their anatomy across all species in accordance with atmospheric changes, only small ones surviving through natural selection or adaptation due to the environment. If plankton is responsible for up to 80% of the Earth's atmosphere oxygen, then global forestry annihilation would not be enough to make these dramatic oxygen adjustments we observe in the records. Unless a global flood wiped out enormous quantities of plankton along with the terrestrial vegetation, which is exactly what we observe in the, in the fossil records. 
Uh, like the Gulo gene, that's a nested hierarchy that's used to support evolution, despite the obvious discrepancies regarding the scattering of this deactivated gene in creatures in various lineages. Uh, this gene supports the global flood's impact on the environment, rendering the gene deactivated from a biblical perspective. Historically, the Earth was 35% oxygen, with much, much less nitrogen and other potential gases. This accounted for giant bugs that we observe in the fossil records, enormous spiders and dragonflies, dragonflies so large it baffles scientists how it could fly in our current environment. It's important to note that the context of biblical lifespans and sizes, as well as complete vegetation wipeouts and enormous amounts of plankton, the only viable conclusion is that Earth's oxygen was much higher from the biblical perspective. We know there were major differences in the atmosphere of the past. The question is, was it prior to the flood, rendering the flood responsible, or was it billions of years ago? The Gulo gene gives organisms the ability to synthesize vitamin C. Vitamin C is an antioxidant, meaning it breaks down in oxygen. The higher the oxygen content in the atmosphere, the less the vitamin C organisms will attain from consuming vegetation that produces it. Prior to the flood, the animals and humans were herbivores, meaning they only consumed vegetation, vegetation that had much lower amounts of vitamin C due to the oxygen content. Therefore, the gene that synthesized vitamin C was a necessity for the survival of these organisms. After the flood, as more nitrogen and carbon and other elements were pumped into the atmosphere, the oxygen was depleted. The plants and plankton were severely decreased. The oxygen levels dropped dramatically and continued for centuries. Plants began producing higher volumes of vitamin C in lower oxygen atmospheres, thus rendering this gulo gene unnecessary and even harmful in creatures that previously needed it required and continued to eat amounts of vitamin C, which were overdoses in accordance with their anatomies, hence the gene shut off. This is why we observe such a selected group of creatures that lost this gene, humans, guinea pigs, fruit bats. They can't synthesize vitamin C, whereas many birds, rodents, reptiles, and insects can. It was deactivated in accordance with their anatomies, not their lineages. Biblically, <clears throat> Biblically, this would be in line with oxygen levels. Evolution teaches early ancestors had an abundance of vitamin C rich food, so the genes shut off. Despite evolution teaching humans' main source of food was what they hunted. Then dozens of millions of years of creatures dying from vitamin C deficiency, evolution never reactivated the present gene for the survival of all these species and their genetics. Yet the same process is said to be able to change eggs to live birth to decrease the number of snakes that are eating babies. The point of all this is to show that if we use creation as a basis for every discovery, like we do in secular science, we could fit it into the biblical narratives. Instead, creation is being dismissed as a pseudoscience and mocked as every discovery is being force-fitted into a narrative that excludes the creator despite the evidence. Other evidence is the support of global flood or the fact that the world was indeed underwater, uh, quote, three billion years ago. The Camas Prairie ripples that span 3,000 miles, 200 feet separation, as well as Canada, has been said to have been shaped by water. Mount St. Helens shows uh, an enormous amount of fossils, geological columns, cut Grand Canyons, as well as wrong radiometric dates that um, plays into the role of the, the flood in the narrative. Uh, the biblical kinds is more rooted in biology than um, than a species. Uh, the oldest tree on earth is roughly 5,000 years old, dated to the era of the flood, um, as well as uh, the rainbow clouds, the flood stories, humans age. Uh, if we track it back through um, through actual writings, we can track humanity back roughly 6,000 years, uh, as well as fossil locations. Uh, there's a whole bunch of evidence for the global flood and hopefully we'll dive into a bunch of it today thank you all right you got it and thank you so much evidence of god for your introductory introductory statement uh just a quick little bit of housekeeping and remind everybody uh modern day debate we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science politics and religion we hope you feel welcome and we are going to do q a at the end and thank you dr dino for already putting in a first super chat and i did get your follow up there so uh once again if you want your questions read nice and early at the start of the q a get them in now because uh, i think this is going to be a pretty lively one with that uh over to based theory grayson thank you so much for being here you have 10 minutes on the floor Thanks, Ryan. So, yeah, what you just heard from my opponent was a very interesting, complex story, but let's see how it jives with the evidence. So there are so many different directions that I could approach this from. I kind of think of 
the idea of Noah's flood as being kind of like Santa Claus whenever I learned about it, uh, believed in Santa Claus when I was a kid. And then in first grade, kind of thought about it critically for a second and realized, hey, wait a minute, uh, reindeer don't have wings. They're not aerodynamic. There's nothing that should allow them to fly. And then I started thinking, wait, the logistics of visiting every house in the same night and it just snowballed from there problem after problem from multiple different angles and fields wrong from physics to logistics to the entire concept makes no sense for santa claus when you start thinking about it critically and this is how exactly i would consider the flood whenever you look at it from a critical perspective from physics archaeology history biology geology paleontology doesn't matter the field it falls apart on a critical basis so Let's just look at a couple of those arguments. I mean, some of the pretty easy ones are just that the entire story, just the, the, the beats of the story don't make any sense. Getting that there's just too many animals that you would need to have on that arc to represent modern day biodiversity, even with the super mega evolution from some sort of mythical hybrid kinds that we don't see evidence for. Um, it still doesn't work. It doesn't work how you're dealing with the animal feces, how you're getting them fed, how you're venting the whole thing. It, for eight people, it doesn't make sense to run the ship. It doesn't make sense to have built the ship so quickly by a supposed 900-year-old man. Again, it falls apart on its face. But even just if we accept all that and we have this giant wooden ark, we know the physics of that situation, you cannot build a seaworthy wooden vessel that large. It would just bust apart at the seams with just the, the slightest amount of turbulence in the water, which we know that this was supposed to be a very, very catastrophic flood. So just the very first tidal wave that, that hits it is going to smash this thing to smithereens. They've tried building large scale wooden ships, even just a fraction of the size of Noah's Ark. And they sank almost immediately because of some light waves. The, the, the actual wood itself is not able to be held together. So I, you can come up with explanations about it. Some sort of mythical gopher wood that nobody knows what it is anymore. And it has special magical properties that prevent this from happening. And they had some sort of technology that we don't have today and we can't replicate. Even with modern technology, wooden ships, reinforced by steel, it's still too large for wood. It just bends and warps at the seams and just takes on water and sinks. This it, It's just not feasible on any level. Then we have the evidence from archaeology and human history, which, contrary to what my opponent said, goes much farther back than just 6,000 years. We can do archaeology back millions of years, back to before Homo sapiens. We can still conduct archaeology for like Homo erectus, Homo habilis, even Australopithecus tools. So archaeology goes way beyond this period. Human history goes beyond this period. I mean, the flood is not supposed to be 6,000 years in the the typical creationist view. It's supposed to be 4,400, 4,600 years ago. So that tree that my opponent mentioned, that's older than the flood in this case. So that doesn't make any sense. Um, then we can look at the evidence from ancient DNA. Uh, we can construct human history and migration patterns from ancient DNA, and they definitively preclude the possibility of some sort of giant founding event with only uh, eight people, like a lot of which were brothers, uh, and then going from that to founding the entire population today, that just does not show up in our uh, ancient DNA samples or in our DNA today. It would be written in our DNA if such an event happened, and it's not. Um, you also have the evidence that comes from geology and paleontology, which is going to be my primary focus. I, I think that's the, some of the strongest preclusionary evidence. The evidence that we see today in these geological layers that definitively precludes Noah's flood as basically an impossibility. If you want to claim that the flood happened and it left behind no traces and it's completely unfalsifiable, fine. But that's not the argument that creationists typically make. Young Earth creationists will typically say that the flood not only happened and was global in scale and everything happened uh, with Noah and his ark and all of that, but they'll also say that this flood is responsible for laying down all the geological uh, stratigraphic layers that we see in rocks from the Cambrian layer, Cretaceous layer, all the way up. So 
this is definitively not possible for a flood to do. Um, I want to focus specifically on something called biostratigraphy or commonly called the, uh, the law of faunal succession. And this is, you know, a law. It's a, a reliable observation that there is a difference in the order of fossils as you progress vertically up and down the geologic column. There is a succession of species. And this species succession, this order of the fossil record, cannot physically be due to a flood. Hydrological sorting cannot explain the observations that we make. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about, let's look at plankton, right? My opponent mentioned plankton. I, I, I love the plankton question because it definitively rules out the flood as even being a possibility for what formed these layers. Because plankton, like phytoplankton or benthic plankton at, at the bottom, uh, they live in the same habitat, right? They have relatively the same body density. They have the same mobility. They have the same intelligence levels. They, they would sort the same. They're, they're even relatively similar sizes. They would sort out the same way by a flood, by, hydro, by uh, sorting by water, which would sort by grain size, density, uh, habitat, all those kinds of things that creationists like to attribute. But the plankton question definitively rules that out because when we actually look at the fossil record, we see that plankton are sorted very precisely by species across all the different layers. It's not like they're only found in the top layers or they're only found in the bottom layers. You can find plankton from the Cambrian all the way on up and they're sorted out by species type, even though they might have the same density, they might have the same habitat. They, you know, phytoplankton have to live near the surface by water and they cover almost every available surface on earth, uh, especially in the water. So they're occupying the same habitats. It, water cannot sort these things via species like is observed. Um, you can also take a look at pollen, for example. You don't find any fossilized pollen before uh, like the Mesozoic, okay? Like it comes around in sort of the early Jura Cretaceous, late Jurassic, and that's when you have flowering plants and you start seeing pollen in the fossil record. But we know that pollen gets everywhere. You can even find pollen samples in Antarctica today. Even places where no plants exist, you can still find pollen. Uh, pollen gets all over the place. If there were plants, flowering plants, alive at the time when these layers were formed, you would find pollen fossils, microscopic pollen fossils in those layers. And they're entirely absent. This is statistically impossible if flowering plants existed when these layers were formed. And you don't find any pollen in any of the bottommost layers, like the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, no pollen. Um, and then you also have uh, fossilized footprints, which Again, you see a definitive layer where, where certain layers will only have certain types of footprints. You don't find any mammal footprints in the, the pre-Mesozoic layers when there's, again, no mammals. You see a definitive order to the type of footprints. If these were all laid down within one year by the same event, why would we see an ordering of the footprints, even for animals that occupy the same ecological niche and live in the same kinds of environment? Um, yeah, I could go on and on listing all these different examples. Like we could talk about varves. We could talk about limestone. That also precludes a flood. We could talk about, you know, specimen ridge and igneous layers. Um, there's too many things that we can point to in geology and paleontology. There's too many things that are ex exclusionary evidence for a flood that definitively rule out a flood as being a possible explanation for the actual real world observations. So with that, I guess, I mean, there's so many different corridors that we can go down. I don't know exactly how uh, we'll even just pick on one, but any one of these examples that I brought up is enough to rule out the flood as a possibility. So I'll leave it for there. All right, you got it. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Grayson, and uh, once again, big thank you to uh, our live chat and everybody for being here. Uh, if you haven't already, hit the like button, uh, subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate it. All of these debates will be uploaded to podcast forum within 24 hours. So if you're currently watching on podcast forum and you're wondering, hey, I'd like to ask a question to one of these uh, speakers. I'm hearing some stuff and I want to grill somebody. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss out on our live events uh, where our speakers are also tagged in the description. So, uh, yeah, with all that housekeeping done, I'm going to put the broom away and uh, let these fellows have at it. So evidence of God, I'll give you the floor to respond to some of what you just heard. Alrighty, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Grayson. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there. 
Um, so as far as let's start with the uh, about it, it, the boat not working, not floating. Um, there was there's been several tests, but there was uh, specifically some physics students that did all the math. They worked it out. It was uh, I have it on paper. I think it was Lancaster. Um, yeah, and the University of Lancaster. Yes. Was it I'm Lancaster? Sure. Yeah. So so you know about it. So if they were, did all the math and they sorted out, they did the weight of the boat versus the weight of the animals and they determined mm -hmm. that it would float. Yes. Why are you saying that it's not viable that it would float? OK, so I want to stipulate a few things on that. One, that was like not a peer reviewed study. I mean, they published it in their university like it was peer reviewed by their peers there. It wasn't okay. like these were undergraduate physics students. I, this was just something that they did in class as an exercise. I just want to mm -hmm. say that this is not like some sort of PhD physicist publishing his paper, but they didn't do, quote, all the math. They did amount the amount of math that you would need for the buoyancy calculations. They found that a, a wooden vessel of that size would be buoyant enough to support the the mass of whatever 170 thousand animals or whatever they calculated. Thirty five thousand. Yeah, they, a, a large number of animals. But what they didn't account for is the kinds of tidal stresses, uh, the kind of forces that would stress and break apart these seams. They did not account for that at all. All they were looking at was just the, the rough buoyancy. They were not accounting for all of the dynamics involved in real life scenario. Yeah, no, sure. But that just shows that it at least can have flow, right? So that they've got it up there. So we they know that the weight on the boat and the dimensions, it could at least float, right? So, so then... Just to just to clarify here, like the reason it couldn't float is not because it wouldn't be buoyant enough. I, I acknowledge their math there that it would be buoyant enough. The issue is that the actual movement of the water would create too much stress on this wooden material that would be like connected on a scale of this large that it would bust open the seams. There would be too much stress in the actual structure itself and it would be broken apart by even mild waves. Well, I mean, like that's that's speculation. Do you have examples of of a boat doing like a boat that yeah. size? Like like if he has integrity in the halls, if he's built the boat with certain materials that maybe aren't in the biblical narrative, right? There could be things that he accounted for. There was a reason that God chose Noah to build the boat, right? He he likely knew what he was doing. He didn't just say, "Hey, I'm going to grab a guy and just build a boat, dude," right? Like he knew oh. what he was doing and he understood what he was doing. As well as what I explained with the atmosphere, we got to take on. into before a, you go off to the atmosphere. Go ahead. Before you go that, just let me address what you just said, because there are examples like the largest wooden ships ever made, like the Wyoming wooden. This is what happened to them, even though they were reinforced by steel, which I don't personally think that they had back in the Bronze Age. It was reinforced by steel and still it was busted apart in even just like mild weather. So, yeah, I, I there's plenty of historical and engineering examples like nobody's ever been able to build a wooden boat that is seaworthy that is that size. Okay, so so then when you look at the atmosphere too, right? If the atmosphere was different, there was higher higher amounts of oxygen. Uh, it was a lot different. It was more dense. We know uh, big bugs were flying. We know that the uh, atmosphere was was more dense, right? There was differences in the atmosphere. So if you account for this with the dynamics of the boat, as well as the integrity of the structure was reinforced, right? There's a different atmosphere. We're looking at this boat in our world, but we're also got to consider that it's not. Uh, it's it's the entire world was flooded, right? So the dynamics of how this boat is going to interact in that atmosphere, or sorry, as well as with that atmosphere, is not going to be the same as it would be, say, how we would do an experiment here. Okay, so a couple of points on that. One, I don't think it matters at, like what percentage of the atmosphere is oxygen in terms of like the integrity of a wooden boat in waves. Like the actual dynamic forces are not going to be that impacted by the oxygen composition of the atmosphere. And two. I did hear you say that historically oxygen was 35% of the atmosphere as opposed to like 21% today. But again, this is, I would consider to be cherry picking because you're looking at the max. You're looking back at the Carboniferous and the Permian eras. That's like the maximum amount of oxygen. But then after the Permian extinction, oxygen levels crater out. And when you have some of the largest uh, like life forms that we've seen on our planets, like the dinosaurs, the oxygen levels were actually lower than today, like all through the Mesozoic. It was steadily climbing back up to the oxygen levels we have today. So like these things fluctuate from like 15% to like 30%, like it, it fluctuates over geologic time. So over like between the Mesozoic and the Paleozoic, we see ups and downs in oxygen levels. It's not just this story that you've painted of, well, it, oxygen was so much higher back then, so everything grew so much bigger.
Yeah, so they say that because they have to account for the differences that they see in the geological column, right? But but the, if the oxygen was historically 35% oxygen from a biblical perspective, right? So so if, if the earth was, if things were uh, bigger, they lived longer, this is in line with the oxygen. We know that oxygen was historically higher at one point. Creationists, we put it before the flood, obviously. After the flood, Noah's age decreased. After the flood, things got smaller, right? After the flood, there were a lot of dramatic changes, like the gulo gene shut off, right? Like these are these all fit with the narrative of the oxygen, right? So the reason why we put we say 35% oxygen was out of that time is because we don't believe that there was billions of years of oxygen gotcha. changes. So it's so, got to be somewhere, right? I would say that this doesn't fit with the actual evidence and data for oxygen levels in the past, because it's not like you have pre-flood and post-flood. You have like in the middle of this flood at, from your perspective, right? Because we're talking about a huge drop in oxygen between the Permian and the Triassic period. That's in the middle of these. Those are both layers that are supposed to be laid down by the flood in the young earth creation model. And so in the middle of this, you have these oxygen levels cratering. But then even when you go back before, like before the Carboniferous period, the oxygen levels go down. It's like a big spike in oxygen around the Carboniferous and the Permian era. And before and after that period, the evidence shows us that oxygen was less than today's levels. So I don't think that that fits neatly into the pre and post flood narrative. So yeah, that that could that could see that could help with with the buoyancies and everything that's observed in the fossil records, right? Like like when you mentioned plankton as well, you say that, so so water can organize sand grains, right? Yeah. So so if it can organize sand grains, to say that the plankton were all the same anatomies when they they are showing changes throughout the geological columns, right? So that when they weren't the same anatomy, there were differences. They had different size shells. They had different ways they sat in them. Some of them used gas to for buoyancy there were all these different components to all yes. the plankton let right? me clarify that then because i i didn't claim that they were all the same anatomy I, i'm sorry if that point was misconstrued I, I was saying that um they're all around the same size scale like if we're talking uh about like forams or something they're, they're they're all like around the same size and around the same density right like that like for diatoms they're all going to be making exoskeletons of the same density from car uh, calcium carbonate. So it, it's going to be the, around the same density, even though you have different shapes and different patterns, they're all around the same size, around the same density. Like they would be hydrologically sorted just as a total mixed bag if water was going to be sorting these things. Like water can sort things based on density, based on granule size, et cetera. But that's not the kind of ordering that we see in the stratigraphic record or in like biostratigraphy of fossil order. We we don't see these things neatly sorted by density or size. For example, like trilobites have roughly the same like body plans. Like you might find like small variations be between them, but roughly the the difference between like one trilobite and another, they, they're gonna have around the same density. They're gonna be sorted by size it, by water. And we don't see them sorted by size when we actually look at the various layers. That's not how trilobites are sorted. So water is not a potential explanation for what is sorting these things. Well, so so a lot of the creatures like so we, we don't have them to observe them and examine them and see what the anatomy is, the differences. Right. We can look at the fossils and we can see, oh, they look similar. But the fact of the matter, it's the same with turtles. We can look at the fossils and see, oh, they look similar. But we don't have these things to actually examine their anatomy. So when we say that water couldn't uh, organize them hydrologically sorting um, it, it's it's really a lot of speculation we have to jump into because we don't know what they were how like how their anatomies were like were built and and if they had differences if some of them were in their shell a little bit too much some of them were all these little things are going to make an enormous difference when the water is moving these objects every little nook and cranny is going to contribute to this right i have a trilobite fossil right here you can make out pretty small anatomical details from this thing I'm but it's stone right very well but you can literally see like the individual points on this thing's eyeballs like you you can see like really, really fine anatomical features. You can determine a creature's anatomy from it, a, a, a fossil record of it.
Well, you can determine its anatomy, absolutely, but it's it's makeup, like what it's made of, right? Like these are differences that's made of stone, right? We can't get in there and we can't see uh, if this one was a little bit different than this one in this way, and that one was a little bit of different, and like, and we see that so much with species, right? So many species have little tiny differences that to water hydrologically sorting would make all the difference in the world, right? So, so like even said, oh, you said the eyeballs. Right. Even something as simple as that could make a huge, enormous change in hydrologic. It's, it's really not going to make that big of a change for hydrologic sorting. I mean, it's not going to be that precise on any means. But you can also look at organisms that like necessarily have the same density and interaction with water, like phytoplankton, the type of plankton that have to live at the very top layer of water because they need to photosynthesize. And so they need to live at that top layer. And these plankton don't have mobility. They're just going around with the tides, right? So they have to maintain a certain density in order to be constantly floating at the layer that they need to access the sunlight. So phytoplankton species all have to have around the same density just in order to do what phytoplankton do. And again, we can see in the fossil record for phytoplankton, we can literally see this success, like this faunal succession uh, of species to species and species. Like if you give one species of plankton, you can accurately predict what species you'll find in the layers above it and what species you'll find in the layers below it. There is this pattern here. Yeah. So, so we also like during the flood, uh, we also would have had the combination of salt water and fresh water. We would have had things uh, uh, being pumped into the water, like different CO2s, different kinds of, uh, of components being, being pumped in different gases being pumped in all these things are going to affect buoyancies right so like we can go back and forth about the anatomies and hydrologic sorting and how it would sort it but the fact is is we don't know what chemical compounds were in the water we don't know what these things were technically made up of we right like there are a lot of factors that are missing here right so the water can hydrologically sort sands grain uh sand grains in accordance with their its its makeup yeah. so to say that it can't sort when we know that there's little variated changes in all of these organisms. And I agree, some of them are scattered throughout the whole column, right? But this could have been, you know, affected by, by things like, like the water was shooting things around and it kept certain things to the top because of the buoyancy. And then some CO2 went off in the water or, you know, salt water interacted with the fresh water and it. You know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of different options sure. as how they can interact. Sure. Well, personally, I don't think that any of those options are going to rescue you from from this. I don't think any composition of water is going to magically sort phytoplankton by species um, or any dynamics within the water. But that's fine to have that uh, as a hypothesis and to say, look, I I hypothesize that there's some dynamic about this water that could explain these observations. The challenge is then to go and test that hypothesis and find what dynamics could be driving this. And creationists, to my knowledge, have not been able to produce any results that would show us what would be actually needed to explain things. Like, let's look at the, the fossil uh, footprints, because this I see absolutely no possible explanation for, for any dynamics about what's going on in the water. Because these are footprints, like, in the layers, like, that you're saying are all laid down in one year by the flood, but you have, you know, really basal uh, tetrapods and amphibians and stuff at the at the lower levels making footprints and then as you go up you, you get dinosaur footprints in the middle layers where you find the dinosaurs and then at the top layers you get mammal footprints where you find mammals so like how is water going to be sorting footprints yeah so so throughout the the time frame of the flood the like the the earth was flooded the bible says the earth was flooded the highest mountain was covered but it also says when Noah released the dove, it brought back a two month old plant. Right. So the, the, the issue that we have here is that the, the flood, the floodwaters weren't on the earth the entire time. They were receding. The, the fountains of the deep were bursting open. They were sucking in. They were going back out. Right. We don't know what was going on. It was just chaos. So a lot of these things could have gotten to higher ground at some point, came back down right? Put their fossils there. I understand that, right? It's like, oh, well, this guy's here and this guy's here. And that's, that's interesting. But I mean, that doesn't, it's not impossible that these things got away from the flood and managed to come back when it subsided. Tsunamis, for instance, tsunamis will retract for six hours sometimes and then come back in and kill everybody, right? So there are huge time gaps where these animals would have thought it was okay 
And with everything that was going on, they were probably hungry. They were confused, disoriented. There was a lot of stuff going on, right? Sure. I, I would agree that it would be very chaotic. And so for such a chaotic catastrophe to create this very neatly ordered situation of footprints changing as we go up each successive layer, it doesn't really make sense how such a chaotic situation like, OK, so the, the waters come back from a certain area and then animals flee to it. Why is it that for like in the Jurassic layer, you don't get any large mammal footprints like the mammoths weren't fleeing over there, the the the, the giant prehistoric ground sloths, none of those were, were fleeing in that area. But then all these large dinosaurs that could occupy similar niches ecologically, they did flee over to that area. And then uh, more layers are laid down on top of it and the waters recede again. And then it's all of a sudden now it's the mammoth turn to flee to that area and all the dinosaurs are just absent. Uh, this doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, it's I understand what you're saying. It's not impossible. There's also mudslides. You know, there could have been mud that came down and took the place of these things. Like there's all kinds of options that that's the thing that the flood is so chaotic. There's so much stuff going on. Right. Like like, yeah, it's it's strange that we find them this way, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. And if you if you think about it and you start to think about their anatomies, maybe there's more of a reason why we find them um in succession in this way right maybe one was going after another maybe like who, like who knows what was going on there but i mean the fact that there's footprints there I, I i agree it's unique and it's interesting but we we don't know the circumstances of it so we just have to speculate things can come things can go sometimes it's a mammoth sometimes it's a dinosaur mud can slide from the top of somewhere and take the place over top and put a layer and it appears that he walked there but he didn't he walked up there right like there's lots of possibilities that could have happened during this time so it, it just sounds very just so very ad hoc and i could maybe believe it like maybe it's not the most likely series of events to happen in like one particular area like maybe oh you only have um you know ancient tetrapods walking across the surface of these flood layers first and then the flood comes back lays a bunch more and now you've got um, you know, a, a, a bunch of uh, Permian Gorgonopsids on top of that. And then another one comes off in the dinosaurs and then another one comes off in the mammoths walk on top of that. Like maybe for one region on earth, I could say, well, look, you know, th that's pretty low possibility of happening. Just all these animals coexisted at the same time, but coincidentally, only one type of each animal was making footprints at each layer. But then when you say, but that's happening in these layers all across the world like whenever you go to like um a, a carboniferous layer and, and you look at what kind of footprints are being laid it's exclusively carboniferous animals you're not finding rabbit foot you're not finding deer you're not finding mammoths like that just strains credulity that i, I, I that's too much of a coincidence i think that's statistically impossible personally yeah no, I see what you're saying, and I'll I'll definitely look look into this. I knew there were footprints, but I didn't know exactly how they relate. So I'll look into it and I'll think about it. But I mean, it's not impossible, right? Things happen. We don't know what was going on at the time. There might be a reason that they're correlated that way. Um, when I when I get a chance to to look at it, might have to do with, you know, their ability to hide. Like each creature has its different techniques, right? That might play a big role in why they we see it laid out like in such a way right so and i mean with like density also i mean like i was saying earlier you have the woolly mammoths up on the top layers like the one of the most dense animals ever to live is at the top of these layers so i'm not sure how density helps you out there especially when at the very bottom of the layers you've got like single celled organisms <laughs> at the very bottom so i i'm not buying any like any uh attribute of hydrological sorting every, every way that we know that water can actually sort granules does not explain the order of fossils that we see like it, it actually flies in the face of it the orders of the fossil we see preclude the possibility that this came about via hydrologic sorting well it's not necessarily sorting by size right and a lot of times we'll see yeah, like it, it all depends on on the like the, the like you said the density of the object, right? So yeah, so maybe there's a mammoth at the top, and you know there's smaller things at the bottom, but there's reasons and like like I said before, there's different interactions with the water that can contribute to these factors, right? Um, 
But the so densities about- have nothing to do with the size. It's not about the size. It's about their makeup, their bone structures. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, like how much buoyancy is in their, their, their anatomy altogether, right? That's what makes the difference when you're talking about hydrologic sorting. It's not necessarily size. But what about what about a place like Specimen Ridge at Yellowstone, where you have, I think, 27 consecutive layers of of repeti- of repetitions between an ancient fossilized, like a preserved forest layer, where you have all these trees and stumps and everything, all these plants from a forest, and then it's covered by an igneous layer from an erupting volcano like we see at like Mount Vesuvius or Mount St. Helens or something. And then above that, we have another layer of ancient fossilized forest. And then above that, another volcanic eruption. And this repeats 27 times. How do you have 27 instances where a full forest is destroyed by a volcano and then a new ash layer is formed and then another forest grows up out of that volcanic layer and then a volcano explodes again and covers that and that happens 27 times all within the period of one year for the flood? Does does that sound likely? And also just to point out, these volcanic layers do not form in the presence of water. Like they involve tuffite, which like, it, it, it's not going to form if everything is underwater. So uh, apparently for this 27 instances of a forest growing and getting covered by a volcano and then growing and then eruption, the flood was nowhere to be found. There was no large flood going on. It's just 27 instances of, of this happening. How does that fit into a flood? Well, how do you know it wasn't all one volcano that did it? Like they're all the same trees, right? They're all the same kind of trees there. It's yeah, all one, the, one forest trees, right? Like they're not, it's, the it's same a, like a what? but it's like a 15 million year span, right? And we got all the same trees laid down in this spot and volcanic ash, you're right, it's layered on top, but this could be explained by one single volcanic eruption and trees coming down, sliding down, moving, they're upside down, they're sideways, rolling, tumbling. If a big enough, like like uh, Yellowstone, if it erupted, they say it'd be devastating to the whole planet, right? So so think about how much that could have caused of devastation at that time. And yeah, so it's laid down and then the ash settled and then all of a sudden everything just collapsed. Like it just it just kept happening. It's insane, but not impossible. So here's the thing about why we would know that it's not just one volcanic eruption causing this, because we have examples of volcanic eruptions and what they look like in the geologic record. And you can see that they create one layer. One eruption creates one layer. It doesn't create 27 layers where it's like a sandwich between ancient preserved forest, volcanic layer, ancient forest, volcanic layer. Like there's not an instance of that happening from one eruption. Like we have eruptions, single eruptions that we can compare this to. And we see what type of actual layers single eruptions create. And this is not one of them. Yeah, but I like so one eruption meaning like in the time frame. So continual eruption. So if if it erupted and then it erupted like consecutively after or consecutively after and then after like the same volcano, if it were that big and that massive and there was that much devastating going devastation going on to the earth, it wouldn't be insane to think that this volcano just kept bursting right and giving it time the issue here is where'd all the trees come from how were new forests grown but if the span if the if the span reached such a great distance it's not you know impossible to think that these trees being the same as all the others were from the same forest and it was different portions of the forest that kept getting laid. And that's why we see them toppled. We see them sideways, upside down, standing yeah. up, right? Because there was devastation coming. They weren't just covered. Because they were the, devastated. Because you you have an issue there with how do the trees get to the same location? Or you have one location, a very a large uh land area where you have all these trees, and then you have the igneous layer on top, right? And then that needs to like form an actual layer of tough fight which doesn't happen underwater and then the other trees need to pile on top of that layer once it's already formed if, if a bunch of trees just come and just fall onto the ash layer then you're not going to create this neat sandwich of an igneous layer and then the fossilized trees then the fossilized trees then the igneous layer that's not going to happen if it's all if, if, if there's not a chance for that igneous layer to actually solidify um, and, and in order for it to solidify it, the way that it did, the form the type of geologic layer that it formed, it, it can't form like that underwater. So the water is not cannot explain where these these trees are coming from if this all happens so quickly in only a year. 
So, so, but if they were all laid down, say in the same time frame, consecutively, like we were, like I was saying, and then at the last layer was covered, and then the waters rushed back in, and you got like you know five billion tons of water now on top, yep. compressing everything down. Right? It yep. would give a lot more explanation as how it would cement these these rocks with that type of compression um in that time and everything was laid so we would only have to have that kind of weight touching the top layer and everything underneath would kind of you know fall in place yeah. like this. so the water would wash away the ash layer it wouldn't form tough fight like the, the the tough fight that we see there formed is is the type that does not form in the presence of water so but that's what i'm saying this, this that's mesh. what i'm saying it's the top layer so once it was done and it was laid then the water ran in again, right? So it was all laid over however many hours or whatever. Then once it was laid and it was finalized and all the layers were set in place, then all the weight came in to compress everything down, right? And that means that the water wouldn't have got to the lower because that kind of weight would would stop the water from going into the earth. It would compress everything, squeeze everything tight, and that could explain what we see there at Specimen Ridge. Yeah, I, I personally, I think it sounds pretty far fetched as an explanation to me. Um, that that being said, uh, would you like to to move on to maybe a, a different topic? I think we've done specimen ridge a bit. Um, so personally, I think that radiometric dating um, alone also precludes the possibility of a flood because each one of these layers, if they were laid down in one year, right? We would not expect there to be an order to the various ratios of radiometric isotopes that are found in these layers. Um, but we do see that, like reliably so. Like there are fossil fuel uh, companies that will, as one of the methods that they do to find oil deposits, they will look around areas that have a certain radiometric isotope composition. And I see no explanation for why that would be the case in young earth creationism. Like if you give me a certain a ratio of isotopes, I could tell you what kind of fossils you would find above that layer and what type you would find below that layer. So that, that's like a, a very clear and strong correlation. Why would there that correlation exist in a flood model? Well, <clears throat> um, if, if like, if the earth come, comes, if the earth inside the earth is radioactive, right? So if you have elements, the earth is opening up, it's sending these kind of uh, elements out into the atmosphere. Water can carry these isotopes, right? Water can bring these things to the place they need to be. This can explain how, and then you got the compression, the compression pushing everything, soaking everything, draining everything, right? It's, it's a system of compression and what's coming from the earth coming together to give these uh, these dates, the apparent look that they they go in line, but really it could be isotopes that were added after during or sorry during the formation leaking in through porous rock or whatever coming in and then it was compressed right. So we don't know what these things started with. We have to. That's why I, with radiometric dating we have to assume all the isotope ratios right um, because we don't know what they started with. And in an event like the flood where the Earth is opening up and shooting out all these different kinds of things and there's all these different things that interact like acidic waters all kinds of different things that interact with these isotopes and carry them along the way i mean that could explain how we see these isotopes laid out in geological columns so if we just saw like a mess of all of these different isotopes at like you know random ratios in all the different layers i would agree that maybe your explanation was possible but what we see is like of a, a, a very neat ordering of like this layer will be nearby radiometric isotopes of, of these ratios. Like there's a correspondence there. You can tell what kind of fossils will be found in the surrounding rock if you know what kind of radiometric isotopes are nearby it. Like there is this order to it. And I don't see this huge chaotic system of all of these, you know, geysers opening up from earth and spewing out all this hot radiometric material. I don't see how that then creates this nice, neat, orderly, layered situation of radiometric isotopes that we find. And in terms of what you're talking about, where you have to make all these assumptions about the initial conditions, um, there's two different methods. Well, first of all, 
there's a number of different methods for radiometric dating and all of them involve different assumptions and they all cross corroborate and these assumptions like the assumptions for like uh, dating something with oxygen isotopes are going to be totally different than the assumptions for potassium argon dating and, and independent assumptions but yet the dates you get cross corroborate with each other there's also methods that don't involve any assumptions about initial conditions like isochron dating which again cross corroborates with all the other methods and you're not making any assumptions about the initial conditions of the of the sample and then there's stuff like zircon dating which is the very oldest that's the uranium isotopes that's how we date like the age of the entire earth those are the oldest radiometric dates we get from zircon crystals and zircons we know for a fact cannot form with any appreciable amount of daughter isotope it's uranium lead dating and you cannot form a zircon crystal in the lab in nature no one's ever observed a zircon crystal forming with any amount of starting lead these things like it's precluded by the actual crystal structure of the zircon they cannot contain any lead initially so we do know the initial conditions for things like zircon crystals we don't need the initial conditions for stuff like isochron dating and then all the other ones where you're making assumptions about the initial conditions they're independent assumptions and they cross corroborate so we can rely on them yeah <clears throat> so like uh, molten lava if it uh go it can um <clears throat> it can melt the isotopes and crystallize the um it can cause it can cause the isotopes to reset right if molten lava falls on the sample and it melts it it can reset the clock for the radiometric date right so if we're looking at the bottom layers this could also help explain why we're seeing things in certain orders because of that kind of heat or as well as like when <clears throat> all the water is bringing the isotopes in and it's being compressed with all that weight, right? Like those crystals you're speaking of, we also don't have that kind of weight to experiment with that, right? We don't have the weight of, you know, a 6 billion ton amount of water to throw on that thing and see what happens. The As, as well as the different chemicals that roll, there's all these different factors that the earth is giving so much in that flood. If the earth really opened up, it, the the elements that are coming out are like limitless, right? Like we don't know what was shooting out. Of, and it says the fountains of the deep burst forward, right? So it was sending all kinds of stuff out. And then you have the lava that can cook, uh, reset the clocks and you have the water that can bring it in and it squeezes like a sponge and it drains down in the heavier elements. And like the, there is lots of reasons how these isotopes can get moved around like that. As far as the organization, it could have something to do with the compression of Okay, so first of all, like if you had some sort of damage or leak, like if some lava damaged the crystal and some lead uh, was like leaked into it, you would see that. You would see that the crystal is damaged and you would not use it as a sample for zircon dating. Like they only date zircon crystals that are pristine, that don't have any of these like uh, leaks from the environment. Cause you can see them in the crystal structure. If there's a crack, if it's been damaged by heat, you can see that resulting damage in the zircon structure. You can tell if that has happened. Um, and then we actually do have access to the high amounts of pressure that are needed to make zircon crystals synthetically. You, you can make them in a lab. You just can't make them with any starting amount of lead in them because it actually does not fit into the crystal structure. You can't force it or else it breaks and cracks the crystal or melts it. So yeah, you can tell if that's happened. Same with isochron dating. If you get if you if you plot out all your isochron data, it forms a nice little straight line, like a little slope line. And if your data varies from that line, then you can tell if it's not pristine, if there's been a leak or if something has broken or has gotten in and it has contaminated your sample. You can tell if your sample is contaminated based on the actual isochron data plot. So it, it does account for the things that you're 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 saying in those examples. The isochron dating it, it so it it dates the parent and daughter isotopes in reference to non-decaying isotopes. Isn't that what it's doing? And then it's um, plotting it, and then if it's it, right, it's plotting it down, and then the conclusion based on that is that the sample was okay. That's how they do it, right? Yeah. And and they they. They, they also a lot of rocks will give you multiple different samples at different points. That's why they don't take from the edge of rocks, right? They take the the inside because they're more likely to give random different dates, right? So you, you want to make sure that you're dating from like this same formation. Like what, what you're saying with the edges is because some of the places where where Snelling and and some creationists have tested isochron dating, 
they've they've tested it at places that have obviously like that there there have been newer formations that that and they're trying to say that it's from the same formation so i i think that's what you're you're talking about with there with the edges of the rocks but you want to make sure that you're dating the same formation yeah 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 so so with, with rating metric dating my problem with rating metric dating is is if so if if we fit if we fit it into 6,000 years. If, if science was on board with 6,000 years and that's how we ran everything, because it's no secret, everything is attributed to the model that we have in science, right? Creation is, I mean, most of the articles you read on, you know, like these type of things, they degrade creationists for a good portion of it, right? It's a pretty common factor. So where the, the if we added did all the science and spent all the money and all the time to somehow connect this to a six thousand year old model, I'm sure they could come up with that as well, right? The fact and the same with the crystals. Just because we haven't observed them yet, doesn't mean we won't observe them, right? It's the same thing with uh, with a lot of things that we don't observe or we don't know how to do, but then we learn about it. Like I was talking about with the birds, right? We're seeing the atmosphere change and all of a sudden we're seeing this macro evolution in these birds. This is something we didn't think was possible, right? So just because we don't see things now doesn't mean that in the future it can't be explained. And that kind of weight or melting with that water combined in the different chemicals, I mean, there are different options if people would put the time into experiment these things that could possibly so, be fruitful so let me just say that um you know absolutely if somebody comes out and documents the formation of zircon crystals that have lead in the starting uh condition of the crystal then i, I will just totally admit that i was wrong and that the evidence has shown that you can make these crystals with lead in them but nobody's done that yet. So until somebody does that, then there's not going to be evidence for me to conclude. Um, but, but anyways, um, specifically on what you're saying, if can you fit everything in science down to the 6,000 year history? I would say no, you cannot. Um, and there are a few examples I would point to, like um, something like the Karoo formation in Africa has like 800 billion vertebrates in it. Like if all of those were alive, like there would be such a density of animals. I think that it would be impossible um, or like um, for like plankton, right? We have so many plankton fossils that if all of them existed on earth at the same time, like pre-flood or something, there are so many of these fossils that it would basically crowd out the entire oceans and that none of them would be able to live because there's only a certain amount of sunlight that we get on earth. And it, it, there's not enough energy into the system to support that number of organisms. Like you're talking about like thousands of organisms per square foot on Earth. Like there's just too many organisms to all exist at once. And we can even do this in like the, the human archaeological record. If we look at like the stone tools that are created by humans, um, there are so, so many stone tools created by humans in just Africa alone, because that's where most of the stone tools are are in Africa that like every person that ever lived in Africa would have to be creating like thousands of stone tools every single day that they were alive. Like they couldn't do anything else. They had to create stone tools all day, 24 seven, and they still wouldn't be able to create the number of stone tools that are found in Africa. So there are these impossibilities when you try to take these, these billions of years date and compress them to 6,000 years. We didn't even get to the biggest one, which is the heat problem. You brought it up before a little bit with the amount of heat that are vented in these giant uh, fountains of the deep. And they're, they're emitting all this radioactive material on lava and heat. Like, how do you get rid of all that heat? It would melt the surface of the earth. Well, <clears throat> well, it was in controlled settings, right? So if the fountains of the deep, so, so my, uh, theory is that the fountains of the deep burst forward and cut the continents right so like water jet cutting uh it doesn't it doesn't produce any heat right so if the water broke through through the fountains of the deep and it cut the continents that would produce no heat in itself and there are radioactive things coming out uh in in the form of particles right so i'm not saying that the earth is opening up and shooting lava out it says it was shooting water out but there would definitely be particles coming out of the earth in those scenarios so um that's what i'm saying i'm not saying a bunch of radioactive lava from the core of the earth was pouring out the bible doesn't give that perspective at all but water was shooting out and stuff would have been coming out after it 
So yeah, even, okay. So there's a few sources of heat here. I don't know about the whole cutting of the continents. Are you assuming like Pangea before the flood and then the fountains yeah. of the deep break open and the water jets are cutting the continents? Exactly. And then those continents would have to move into their current position, right? Yeah. So that's going to create two sources of heat, right? Because you have, that has to happen really, really fast. That can't take millions How of years. How fast does it have to happen? At least within the, like the, the, time frame of like a couple thousand years like at least well, if, if we go from the time frame of the flood if we're talking like the five thousand years right then you take the it, the continents are only like eight thousand not even they're like two to six thousand miles apart right yeah. so if you divide that by the six thousand five thousand years or whatever we're talking mere miles a year that these things have to move yeah, that's not gonna... very, very big, heavy things. They have a lot of kinetic energy. Even with that low velocity, the amount of mass that they have means that they have a lot of kinetic energy. And for those things to be moving at that pace, to then slow down to the pace that they're currently moving, that is going to expend a ton of that kinetic energy in the form of friction and heat. And so you have that heat source. You also have the heat source for the in-between this, right? It's not like there's just ocean in between them you have to form a, like ocean oceanic crust in between these continents as they move and so that takes like the mid-atlantic ridge right it's pumping out like a bunch of of lava that then it, that's what is propelling these continents to move apart from each other so the amount of lava that would have to be pumped out by something like the mid-atlantic ridge for them to move into our current position that's another heat source because all that lava has to then be cooled a, 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 as it moves apart and then you have the other heat source just from the radiometric uh, uh, isotopes themselves, where you like you have to have all the radiometric isotopes that are found in between the layers that you're saying are formed in the flood. So I don't know what top and bottom bounds that you put to that. Every creationist kind of is giving a little bit different answers, but whatever that is, like Cambrian to the Cretaceous, whatever it is, all of the radiometric material in those layers would have to then decay within that short period of time or you're, you're gonna have to explain how you have all the starting amount of daughter elements and that is another source of heat all this source of heat i don't know if you crunched the numbers for this but like that is a ridiculous amount of heat i mean at the very least it would burn noah's ark and all the animals on it well if the if the daughter elements uh came from like if so if the earth shot up so so water cools things right so as the continents are moving we've got to think there's going to be a lot of water there's going to be a lot of mud they're going to lubricate these plates these plates are moving really slow just miles a year and it's all lubricated and the water entered back in the earth so there's a whole ton of water in there it wouldn't lubricate <laughs> it, it wouldn't lubricate continents like that because at that point what you're talking about continents you're talking about like such high temperatures and pressures at that point that it wouldn't be acting as a liquid lubricant i mean like the water that's formed like that's found deep in those layers is not in a liquid form um, it's like in ringwoodite and crystals and things so it's not acting as a lubricant and mud certainly isn't going to lubricate anything like at those intense uh conditions but it's i mean the water so the water so this is the difference. We believe that the water went back into the earth, right? And even when they dug the deepest hole, they found water in the earth. The water is in the earth, right? right. It's a theory, but we think what is in the earth, it's we we haven't gotten there to see. The deepest mile uh, hole on earth was seven miles long. That's it. That's the deepest we've got. So it's all theory. And we found water down there. So if there is a lot of water, um, pressurized water, uh, different uh, makeups, muds, all kinds of different things, Things, there's no reason to think that, that it wasn't enough to constantly lubricate the plates as they moved. If they're moving slow, the water would crash back in, lubricate the plates, cause the mud from, from the plates, and they would move again. They're moving only miles a year. It's it's barely moving, right? So yeah, I like don't I... see where all the heat's coming from. I understand they're big, but they're moving so slow, and they have water in different components that are lubricating the plates as they move. Yeah, again, like water at that high pressure is not going to lubricate anything. It's not going to be in a liquid form. It's going to create mud, pressure. though. It's going to turn all, all the... No, it's going to be too hot and high pressure for stuff like mud to, to exist or to lubricate anything. And Why would it be too hot? Down there, where you're saying, like, it gets hotter the further down you go. You realize that, right? Like, whenever they yeah. dug eight miles in the ground, it was really, really hot down there. It was there. hot, really yeah. Really high pressure. 
but we're, when we're talking about the flood, like all the waters came back in. So you have all that water coming back in. It's going to cool it. Everything cooled. We went into the ice age, the oceans, uh, uh, everything thickened in the atmosphere, right? We went into the ice age after. Well, so, is the ice age even biblically attested? Well, I mean, the ice age had to come after, right? And the Bible, the, in the Bible, they were in the Middle East, so they weren't really affected by the last ice age, right? The last ice age didn't really hit the Middle East, and they all just happened to be in that safe space, right? So well, we have the, evidence, like you pointed to saying, like, well, three billion years ago, before the formation of continents in the consensus model, you had the whole world underwater, right? And so if you're if you're willing to pull stuff from there that's three billion years ago before all of these layers were formed right then you could pull back to like i don't know 700 million years ago and snowball earth when the entire earth was covered in snow and ice and glaciers and so yeah the middle east would be covered at that point so I, again i i don't understand why you even accept that an ice age happened if you're willing to throw out so much other stuff that science has has shown then like Something like the Ice Age, which to my knowledge is never mentioned in the biblical narrative at all. I don't understand why you think that you have to account for an Ice Age if you're not accounting for all this other stuff. Oh, because we, we have glaciers. We know that there were places where the ice existed, right? We know that when the water came in, that it had to, there were parts of the earth that were being cooled by water and creating ice, probably during the flood. It was creating, uh, there were cold areas on the earth, right? So this is where the ice age comes from. Um, as far as the, the Middle East uh, being under ice at one point, I mean, that could have been through history. That could have been through, through creation. That could just be... Um, like like uh um like there's no there's no signs of or i guess there's no signs of of glaciers they're basing it based on the uh the lakes and the rivers right in the middle east this i think if you can find <laughs> evidence for like glaciation from the snowball earth period like even in regions like the middle east and equatorial regions at the time but like i find this really interesting that in terms of an ice age, you're willing to examine the current state of the L L of the evidence, like glaciation evidence, and you're willing to then try to figure out how that ice age happened back then. And you're, it seems like you're you're being evidence led when it's something that doesn't explicitly contradict with the Bible. But as soon as something explicitly contradicts with the Bible, like the evidence that the flood did not explain all these layers, then it it feels like you're not being evidence-based and you're trying to say, well, look, somehow the flood narrative could maybe potentially well, like with technology we don't know or methods we don't know or compositions we don't know, maybe there's a way that it could explain this. It seems like your reasoning is totally flipped versus when you're just looking at, well, there's evidence of a glaciation, so therefore we know that an ice age happened. That It, it seems like one is evidence-led and then the other is <laughs> led by your convictions to the biblical narrative. Well, that's fine. I'm I'm fine with that. If if the ice age, if parts of the earth were cold, right? So when I say the ice age, we're just the parts of the earth were cold. We we have to account for the ice. So there were parts of the earth that were cold, and the water was coming in and creating uh, contributing to these areas, right? So when I say ice age, I don't necessarily mean like a thousands years. I just mean that the atmosphere cooled down, and there were parts on the earth that got cold, and there were ice buildups in those parts, right? No. I don't necessarily I think mean that that's a good way to go about it. Frozen, right? I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I do think that that's a good way to go about it. I mean, I, I think you're you're looking at the evidence and saying, well, like this evidence exists, therefore an ice age or some sort of glaciation, something must explain this evidence. But like, we know what the evidence for a global flood would be. Like, we do have examples of mega flood deposits, like actual sedimentary deposits that we do know were caused by a giant flood like we do have mega flood deposit layers and we do know what kind of characteristics they share generally what the general look of like when layers are actually laid down by a mega flood they look like this like they have certain patterns like there's a, a an ordering to the coarseness of the grains there's silt bed layers there's like there's certain characteristics that we can see that we can say okay this was uh done this was laid down by a flood but when we look at the overall layers for like the geologic periods, like the Cretaceous and the Cambrian and the Carboniferous, like they're not displaying those traits at all. It's very clear that they are not flood deposits. Well, I mean, the, the flood, 
the, so the, the atmosphere was completely different, right? So things heated up after there's, there's lots of, that's the thing when you're dealing with the flood, it's so unpredictable. There's so many things that could possibly happen. Right. So what, I like when you try to explain it, you're trying to explain something that's unexplainable. The way water interacted, the way it, it moved, the way it cut, the heights that we, it we shot. We can explain right? those things. Like we have hydrodynamics. But not from we not have... from a global flood perspective, right? You can't. So when you're trying to explain those, you have to go into speculation. But if the global flood did happen, then a lot of these things do make sense, how they were set down, how they were sorted, right? A lot of these attributes do make sense and they do explain it. But to sit there and try to explain to you how 6 billion tons of water interacted on the earth and how it laid this and how it laid that, I mean, nobody can jump into that. But just because um, you see like a local flood acts this way doesn't mean that a different atmosphere with 6 billion tons of water uh, pressurizing, laying things, shooting things out of the earth, uh, bringing all these chemicals to the surface um, is going to interact the same way as what you observe with a global flood, the way sediments laid. Yeah, I don't think that a different atmospheric composition is quite the rescue device that it, the, the flood needs it to be. I don't think that you're going to see that different in dynamics of like hydrologic behavior just in different compositions of the atmosphere. Like changing oxygen to 35 percent you're not going to have that drastic of a difference even changing the chemical compositions like the, the fluid dynamics is not going to change that greatly like to where it would just totally become unpredictable what would happen and nobody can say and it's too complicated like we have naturalistic uh models and mechanisms for flood dynamics for fluid dynamics for how sedimentary layers are deposited so i just want to ask you like if you had never read the Bible, you had no idea what any of this was, and you were just looking at the actual evidence. Do you honestly think that you would come to the conclusion just from looking at the evidence, not being influenced by the Bible or anything? Do you really, you, uh, do you genuinely think that you would come to the conclusion that there was a global worldwide flood? Well, I, I think that the, the issue here is that Right. Like there's that's the one thing why a lot of people are being led to the Bible, too, because there's there's a uh, a narrative. Right. There's a narrative being pushed that these things that's the thing. If they would let creationists come in and they would fund these things and they would let them uh, come to these conclusions and see if they're there, all the funding is being thrown at what you call evidence right so it's very hard to contend with a lot of these things because you have piles and piles of people to cite and read whereas people like us we got to go through all the information you it's no no and we got to dig into it we got to sort it all out and figure it out ourselves so well, if i didn't believe in the bible no I probably would agree with you. But the fact that I do believe in the Bible, when I look at the exa examine the evidence and I think about it critically, and there's a lot of things you said here that like I'll go back and I'll think about. You brought a lot of stuff to me today, right? I will go back and I will consider it. I am honest in my conclusions and how I, I come to these conclusions and consider things. I do believe what I say. Um, but I think that there's a narrative that's pushing creationism out and it makes it a lot harder for us to come to the conclusions we need to conclude with the actual science that exists, right? Okay, so just on the, the topic there about funding, like a lot of the people that first made these observations, right? Like the the law of faunal succession, like I was talking about with like the biostratigraphy, this, was, the, this observation was made before evolution. This was made back in like, I think the early 1800s. So like this was a creationist scientist who was making these observations. Like a lot of the observations that led to things like evolution or like the, the scientific consensus we see today was done by creationist scientists like these, like back in the 17 and 1800s. And then in terms of funding, I don't know what you could be referring to, but like places like the Discovery Institute or like Ken Ham, like they have a lot, they have millions of dollars worth of funding and they choose not to do these actual experiments like that they, they, they do not put funding towards experiments and like the discovery institute has even said like we would rather have other industries like the pharmaceutical industry can do the research for us and we don't want to spend the money to actually fund that research ourselves but they have millions i mean it's not a lack of funding 
um, at least for so, like some of these big heavy hitter creationist uh, institutions. Like they spent however many millions of dollars to build an arc replica that is not seaworthy. Yeah, no, and and for sure they have a lot of money and they could do that and they do do a lot of stuff, right? As far as that, um, but like when you think of uh, the Creation Institute, is that or is that what they're called, the Creation Institute? They or Answers in Genesis, isn't it? Is that them? Uh, there's Discovery Institute. There's okay. Answers. Anyways, these guys Being they mine. they um they all fund a lot of things, but then when people hear about it, they'll automatically dismiss it, right? Like you, ca I can't go and quote one of their scientists as something um, and, and any atheistic or evolution, no one's going to take it serious. People will mock it away. They'll just laugh it off. Right. That's the thing is nobody takes these ideas serious. So nobody's going to fund it. And they, I agree, they should fund it. And there's a lot of things that they can do. And I don't know why they don't do more, but I think there should be a fair platform because there is a lot of interesting stuff in the creation model. When you examine the Bible, there really is a lot of interesting evidence that could be connected to what we observe today. Right. Like what? Um, so, oh, there's a, like there's a ton of it, like like everything, like even when you I don't know, give me a biblical story. There's so many different things that are just amazing in the Bible that connect to reality. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've done I don't want to change the subject, but I've done debates on the Exodus and the resurrection and Genesis and all these various biblical stories. I don't see the evidence lining up with them whenever I examine them critically. So I, maybe it's just a difference of opinion there. But um, I mean, I, I would love to do a flood on those. Right. Like um, or the, a debate on those like. The, the, the flood debate, I, I love the flood debate and I love it. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of inter interesting things. You brought a lot of interesting things to me. I get to look up and I get to learn about that, right? But um, I, I those things like the Exodus, there's a lot of evidence for the Exodus. And that's why I don't understand why they say there's, see that? Like, it's interesting, but there is. Like, these are things I focus more on, right? The, the flood is really interesting, but the flood is the one thing where there's so much money put in against it there's so much uh secular science has put in against the flood it's so hard to okay. come to the table on a, on a fair platform so let me let me just clarify that a lot of these uh like creationist scientists that you're talking about right whenever they publish their results they're not publishing in peer-reviewed journals maybe you would say that that's because they're they not going to get accepted into peer-reviewed journals and they, they have to do their own journals that are not peer-reviewed but whatever like you do have examples of scientists that have published results that go against the grain, that go against the consensus, that people say, no, that's impossible. It, it, that they can never have been like that. Like, uh, like Mary Schweitzer is a good go-to example for this, right? The results that she was publishing were against the consensus. She published them anyway in a peer-reviewed journal. It went through peer review. It went through a whole period where people were trying to tear down her results. She was supplying the evidence. She had the supporting evidence to back up her results. And because of that, the consensus changed and she was vindicated. So creationists, I think, could do that if they had the evidence to back it up. The consensus changed to what? The, basically, she had said that she had found... Um, Soft like, tissue. I think soft tissue is too ambiguous of a term. She had found collagen fragments left behind in dinosaur fossil bones. And at the consensus at the time when she discovered this was that those should all have been replaced. Uh, th those shouldn't be the original co collagen fragments should not be there. And she found results indicating otherwise. She knew that her results, her methodology was good and she stood by them and she published that evidence and the consensus changed to now it's accepted that in a lot of dinosaur fossils, you can actually have some of the original collagen in a very fragmented, very cross uh, like connected form um, that, that does show the age of it, but it still is existent in those bones. And the consensus changed. I mean, she changed the consensus because she had the evidence. But she never, that's the thing. She changed the consensus that they find her collagen, as you say, in the bones, but they never once questioned the dates. Like I've watched a lot of things on Mary Schweitzer and she she talks about when she first found it, right? And and she was concerned because she knew exactly the implications of what she was finding, right? That this was not 65 or 85 million years old. And, yeah, well, hold on now. That's not what she said now. Come on. 
that is what she initially thought. Yeah. And in, in an interview, that's what she initially she was like, this can't be here. This can't survive this long. She turned to her assistant and she said, please don't let this be me. I've watched lots of interviews. Initially, she went up to her, her leader and uh, like the head her teacher. And she said to him, um, like, this can't be right. This can't be right that I'm finding this. It's too old. Right. Like, like she knew something was wrong with the dates, but they never once questioned the dates. Right. And the teacher said to her, then falsify it. That's what he said to her. But that's the problem with the dates. They never tried to falsify the dates, right? They just uh, moved because on from that so and said, many... this is here. Okay. Maybe if this was in a vacuum and this was the first evidence or whatever, and we didn't have any other methods that are corroborating the dates that we have. But we have so much evidence, like for the accuracy of radiometric dating. Like we've, we've cross corroborated it throughout known events known dates we've sent random samples to labs they agree i could i, I could send you sources i disagree I, I disagree with that um do, there's Wait, a lab there's let, me a, go through, let me go through the examples then because but this uh, is you publish this is so so when you go to labs and you send so anytime a creationist sends random samples to labs it always comes back with random dates there's always discrepancies right and like you said oh he grabbed it from the edge there's always excuses right um, okay, I, wait, wait. I, I just I, I cannot. OK, these are not excuses. The fact is that when you do a method incorrectly, it is logical to expect incorrect results. So when people point out that when the creationists are doing this and they're sending these these random blinded samples out to different radiometric dating labs and they're shown like, hey, wait, you are using this method incorrectly. You cannot apply this radiometric date dating method to a recent volcanic or a volcanic eruption, or you cannot radiometrically date seashells. Like there, there are like actual ways that you need to use this method in order to do the method correctly. If you intentionally use the method incorrectly, you can be sure that you're going to get incorrect results. But there have been, there's actually, it's not annual, but they do, um, they do, let's see, an international radiocarbon intercomparison with the all around the world, multiple countries, like 50 labs around the world, and they send blind samples. They are not told any information about the dates of these samples, and the samples are are, are of a known date. Like they're they're verified with dendrochronology or history. They they know where these how old these samples are. They send them out to all the different labs, all 50 labs across the world, and they get back the same answers. This last time this was done was I think the fifth one that they did, and it was in 2010. I can send you the results. We've tested Mount Vesuvius. We got the same date we know from history when Pompeii was destroyed. We've tested stuff like the Ulubarun shipwreck in the Bronze Age. That was tested at three different methods. They tested it radiocarbon dating. They tested the tree rings in the ship. And they tested it with the scarabs the, for the specific pharaohs that were found in the treasure on board. And all three different dates all give you the same basic range of like the 1300s BC. Like this has, we have checked the accuracy and reliability of radiometric dating. And we have shown that it is reliable and accurate. So like I'll look into those, but I mean like when, who's like when you publishing these things, like, that's the issue. How do you know that there were anonymous samples? When you send a sample to a lab, you have to tell them. Like, there's a lab that I, I looked up. There's labs I can't, me and you can't send random samples into a lab right now, right? When years ago, like, I wanted to send some samples. I have a collection of old Bibles. And I that's the thing. I wanted to know if radiometric dating was real. So I wanted to send some samples. They don't let you do that. They don't date artifacts. I can't send a painting in for an appraisal like that's the thing if this is such a solid science and it works so well and you can send anonymous anonymous samples why can't you appraise a painting why can't it be used to date my bible like why won't they let me pay money to get yeah. something done that's a solid science because these are not consumer facing businesses like this is not like you don't just start up a radiocarbon dating store that just anybody can come in and radiocarbon but date why not them. if you're gonna if you're gonna force everybody in in the western world to comply with the ideas of these conclusions and tell them that God needs to be taken out of society because we're teaching this because it works. But then I ask you if I can falsify it personally and you say no, but you say, oh, but that guy did it anonymously. Trust me. 
but you can't do it. Right. Right. So <laughs> it's because it's not an economically viable business model to have this kind of radiometric dating business be consumer facing. Like this is pretty niche and is used typically in like, okay, there's a, there's a relatively few amount of institutions that do this. They hire like undergraduate students, like graduate postdoc, whatever, like the, the people working there are like in the process of going through their academic careers. There's a relatively few amounts of places that do this. They have a high expertise that's involved. Like there are specific reasons for like man hours and actual business logistics. Like this would not work out to have a consumer facing business, but also like just the, the this is how a lot of science is done, right? When when you get to the point where you have to have such specialized equipment and expertise in order to do something, like this is why we have peer reviewed published papers. Like you wouldn't say that, well, I think that the L the large hadron collider never found the Higgs boson because they won't let me go over there and see the results myself. I can't go to the Large Hadron Collider and go into the control room when they're running it. I, I, I how could I verify that they found the Higgs boson? Like but that's not that's not the same thing as what we're dealing with. Radiometric dating is used for everything, and then people, normal people, aren't allowed to test it. But then we hear that there's collagen in dinosaur bones, and we hear that there's carbon showing up in dinosaur bones, and that hammers are showing up in rocks that are dated to millions of years. And, you know, there's all these different rocks are giving three different dates and, and different Those types are of ancient. Debunk. Like well, each that's, what you, that's what you say, but that's what I mean. So if it's not for consumer and they just were just not worth the time, then why do they feel like they should be forcing our ideas out of society, push, ushering their ideas in, but I can't pay the $400 that they offer on the website to get something radiocarbon dated because I'm not in an organization, but I should just shut up and agree that it works right Look, like i'm I, not doubting like just because i cannot personally get personally get observation time on the james webb space telescope i that i'm not going to say that they're just fabricating their results or something or we i shouldn't believe what the james webb space telescope is looking at because i can't get access to it i cannot go and sign up for observation time on it myself like i, I just don't think that this but it's not being used to it's not being used to force my identity out of society. It's not being Neither forced. Is radiometric dating. It is. Radiometric dating is the basis for everything. So even what? this dis even even this discussion, right? When it comes down to it, I'm arguing against radiometric dating, and you're arguing from the side of all these different people that agree with it, and it's, it's science. But I can't test it, and you're fine. You're okay with not testing it. You're saying I don't care if I observe it. I'm saying I want to observe it. I want to believe it if it's real. And you're saying, oh well, it's not for consumers. Like that's the problem. If they should, if this is a real thing. They shouldn't just have people sending random samples to these labs where they test them. They should have people like like uh, Kent Hoven and Ken Ham picking samples, right? Coming on a live stream and having it sampled in front of the population. This is the way things should be done because the burden of proof is on the people making the claim. So if you want to push my identity out of society and you want to, you know, convince society that god is not worth believing in because there's no evidence for him i think that it's pretty important that society has the option to verify what's being taught okay they literally do these tests it's just not done by kent hovind or creationists like it's done within by the people that agree with it by huh? people that have no bias that people have a bias the people no, like that believe it work they specifically are blinding these samples. So it doesn't matter if they're biased or not. Like they're sending blind samples. They're not giving them information about the age. And they're choosing ages from modern times all the way back to 40,000 years ago for the radiocarbon uh, intercompatibility conferences that they do. Like they do this uh, regularly. The fifth one happened in 2010. They compared it all across the world, like not just one or two locations, like 50 labs that do this all across the world. So unless there's somehow like this global conspiracy of these labs to forge their results in like countries like, I mean, Russia, China, Iran, they all rely on radiometric dating. They all have labs that do this. And like, 
it just doesn't make any sense that even these countries that are rivals like would all agree on this same thing if it, if if it wasn't actually giving accurate results. I mean, they use this in the fossil fuel industry to make actual decisions related to maximizing their profits. Whenever they want to find oil deposits, one of the methods that they use is by trying to find radiometric uh, isotope ratios that fit a certain ratio. And then they know, hey, oil is more likely to be nearby. Like these are reliable metrics. Yeah, so if they're they're finding the ratios, right? But that's how I agree that radiometric dating is a measuring tool. There's no question about that. I have no qualms with that. My issue is, is it a dating tool? That's what I want to observe myself, right? And I mean, do you at least agree that radiometric dating is being a big portion of the reason that Christianity, I mean, we, we were 80% Christians. Now it's like less than 60 do you do you not agree that radiometric dating plays an enormous role in such such a deconversion? Um, I don't know if I would necessarily. I'd have to think about that more. But like uh, to Matt, you say that radiometric dating is the basis for all of this. But then like you can look to cosmology and like what I brought up with the James Webb has nothing to do with radiometric dating. And yet it does inform our ideas about galaxy formation, the history of the universe. Like we do learn about the timeline of the universe. Like you can calculate the age of the universe using like redshift values and the speed of light. And like you, you can calculate the age of the universe. It's it's not 6,000 years. You don't get 6,000 years from cosmology and that has nothing to do with radiometric dating. So I don't think that it's quite as central and key to what you're laying out because, you know, you already had a lot of people like rejecting young earth creationism from like the early days of geology to like the discovery of evolution. And that was all before radiometric dating. So I, I agree that it, it plays a certain big role in informing the overall time scale of like human history or like history before that dating, like the overall age of the earth and everything in our solar system. But beyond that, it's not like we're ra using radiometric dating to date other galaxies and the universe as a whole. But that, see, the, see, that's exactly it. Like evolution, before radiometric dating, they were saying these are the ages. This is how old these things are. And then they bring in radiometric dating and they go, look, see, we told you. So you're right. Already they observed that evolution was pulling people away from their ideologies and God. And I mean, when you look at communist societies, they get rid of religion first. They always get rid of religion first in all communist societies. So when they saw evolution was getting rid of religion and it was working, the the realistic thing, rational thing to do would be to move on and say, now we can prove it, right? So all I'm asking, and I don't think it's too much, all I'm asking with radiometric dating is to observe it, to, to take a sample from my house that I can date, send it to a lab, have them send me the correct date back, and I'll go, damn, it works. That's that, right? Like, that's the thing. Why should I have to believe something without evidence that goes against my beliefs when there is, there is lots evidence. of... That's what, that's what is the difference, is that there is evidence. It's just you've declared that the evidence is not good enough for you because you're not personally involved with that evidence. Because that's, that's how science necessary. works. Science is a personal experience. So if, if not, none of it's, us, it's not a personal experience. It is. No. It's something. It's something that you learn for yourself. Science is something you practice for yourself, no, right? No, it's so not, these it's guys not. are learning. It, it is. It should be. It's an individual Look, process. They're doing cool. science. No. But I mean, science at the basis. Why would you believe something if Look. you've never done radiometric dating? You've never observed it, and no. you have people with motives telling you it works. Why would you believe that? Look. Okay. The, the great thing about science is that you don't have to go through and make every discovery. You stand on the shoulder of giants. You inherit the knowledge that has been found out by all those before you and you build on it. Like That's blind faith. That's all. That's not you're blind right. Faith. Building on building on discoveries that you can observe yourself. Right. Yeah, you know, so there you, are you certain can. things hold we on, can hold observe. On, wait. So you, you can go back and if you are questioning like what was discovered in a generation before you, you can go back, you can read the original results of the original experiment, you can read what the peer review process was, you can read what people had criticisms, what arguments were offered, and then what eventually congealed that consensus. I guarantee you, 
any arguments that you have have been brought up before. If there's ever anything in the scientific consensus where you say, this doesn't make sense to me, I see all these problems, I guarantee you all those problems have been brought up by other scientists. Like for something to become consensus in science means it had to pass through like dozens and dozens of relevant experts in the field intentionally trying to tear it down and falsify it. That's what passing through peer review means, is that everyone's trying to tear it down, everyone's trying to falsify it, and if they're all unable to do so, then it can pass on to becoming consensus in the field. But this is like, there's a whole history of science before this for all the ideas that are now consensus that have gone through this process. You can look at well, here's how those problems were solved. Here's the evidence that supports this. You can go back through this history. Like, again, science is not this personal endeavor that you are doing. I don't have to go and discover general relativity for myself. I can see, well, here's the evidence that was used to support general relativity. Here's the successful predictions it's made since. You can look at the history. Like, if you just say, you know, I'm not going to accept any scientific discovery that didn't involve me personally verifying it well you're gonna you're not gonna be able to do almost anything like you're not going to be able to like i didn't invent any modern medicines does that mean i shouldn't take a drug even if it's passed through human clinical trials and gone through peer review like no, but these are oh. observable you can observe your friend heal from these drugs right like you can, you can we, i can buy a telescope and i can observe these things in the universe i can look at the stars i can pretty much go and get anything i want in the scientific community that i've been told if i want to learn about uh, special relativity or whatever you just said, I can go and learn these mathematics. I can learn these things. You, you, you can't, you learn can't test radiometric dating. They oh, yes, won't, you, you even agreed. They won't let me, they won't let me do it. There's discrepancies. There's different dates that we went over and they just say, oh, well, it's corrupted. Oh, oh well, okay. that's fine. Right. But I can't do it as a personal endeavor. Okay. I, I agree. There's lots of things that we can experiment and test for ourselves Radiometric dating is not one of them. And that's where I have an issue with it. Okay. There are tons of things that you yourself cannot personally verify. Like you had don't have access to a particle accelerator. That you've never seen an atom. How can you verify that atoms are real? Like there's all these but, things that you personally do not have the expertise or the equipment to verify yourself. Radiometric dating is just one example out of hundreds of examples like but atoms don't have a narrative like that's what it keeps what going mean? back to because there's a narrative in our society to to push the idea of evolution right there's a narrative in our society to push the idea of billions of years which is fine if it's true but they won't let us personally observe these things i don't need to go see an atom it's not stealing my faith from me it's not convincing my children that you know god's not real like it's not doing all these things so i don't care about if the atoms in the accelerators i don't care what my issue is with is the facts that affect me in my life and that's where I have an issue. And that's what I've went over. There's discrepancies yeah. in radiometric dating. No, there's, okay, so there this, is. This is like, I, I just find this interesting. This is kind of what I highlighted earlier, where like you only, like you had no problem using the evidence to conclude that there was an ice age. You have no problem with uh, the scientific consensus that atoms exist because they don't contradict with anything that's said in your Bible. But as soon as science makes a discovery that contradicts it, then all of a sudden, well, wait, I need to verify that personally. Like, you have never been to space. And yet, you know, I don't think that your questioning of space exists or not. I, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that you're a flat earther, but you probably have not personally like done the experiment to to show that the earth is not flat. I mean, there's lots of things that could impact your worldview that you take based on the consensus of experts in the field and the available evidence that you can look at from those experts and peer-reviewed evidence. There's lots of stuff. It's only the things that are uh, contradictory to the biblical narrative. Those are the ones that you latch onto and attack but it seems kind of like you're you're cherry picking from scientific discoveries. You'll accept all the ones that don't contradict the Bible, and then you'll find some kind of excuse or reason yeah. to reject all the ones that contradict it.
it doesn't it doesn't have to uh, the ages of the earth doesn't have to affect the bible right like i i said in the last debate if you look at the theory of special relativity the six days of creation could have been billions of years for all we know the dates don't affect the bible the motives do it's the motives with radiometric dating what's being pushed and they that's the thing like it's being pushed so hard and there's so much you know, research on it and all this funding is going to it and every conclusion is based on it. But then when something comes back, like discrepancies in rocks or, you know, the same sample is producing different dates. And, you know, like we went before, there's all these different discrepancies, hammers and rocks that are old and they just brush it off as corruption and they move on with it. Mary Schweitzer's discovery never once questioned the dates. Nobody Right. Yeah. Like okay. these are issues that falsify this, the, the radiometric dating, but they won't take these into account to pursue that. So I think that there is actually analysis of all the examples that you've gone through. And there's very good reason to think that these discrepancies that you're bringing up are, are not accurate. Like the hammer that was found or whatever, like that, like you can understand why that was partially permineralized based on the surrounding area. It doesn't it, it doesn't preclude anything about the consensus. Like for each one of these examples, right? You have to look at the total sum of the evidence. Like when you have all of this peer reviewed evidence on one side, and then you find one thing that looks like a discrepancy and then you examine it and you see naturalistic explanations for why it is the way it is. And it doesn't conflict with the overall picture, especially the weight of all of the evidence combined. That's what I think is going on here. I, I don't I don't think that there's any like intentional ignoring of any evidence just because it's it's supposed to be a defeater for the entire consensus. And this one piece of evidence, if it's real, it changes everything. Like, I think that when you critically examine each one of those pieces of evidence, it falls apart. <clears throat> well, I mean, like, if you look at like Nazi Germany, Hitler did the same thing. Hitler used science, right? And everybody was going, no, but it's science. And, you know, this, look at the consensus. Look at what the scientists say. You know, they're lower than us. We're more evolved. It's consensus. It's science. Like, these are the same things that we heard to exterminate, to uh, achieve a goal based on a governmental's idea of controlling a people. Okay, it's the well, same thing that we're seeing today. Thanks, so for that. What... Thanks for the Godwin's law there. But I will just point out that Hitler rejected the consensus in science. He rejected universal common ancestry and evolution. He rejected it. Look it up. He also rejected relativity. He called it Jewish science because it was created by Einstein. Like Hitler rejected the consensus in multiple scientific fields. I don't think I think it's a tremendous reach to try to say that's that's well, not the point. The, 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 the scientific consensus is basically like Hitler. <laughs> That's not that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm using Hitler as an example to show you that just because people can say, hey, it's the science and the, it all adds up and there's a consensus. And why would they lie? All these people are a conspiracy. Like these are all things that were said during these periods in time, constantly, not just with Hitler, constantly. Right. Like these are constant things that governments are using to indoctrinate the people and religion always goes first. So all I want to do is test it for myself. That's it. Right. I don't need to see an atom because it's not stealing the faith from my children. I don't need to see it. Tell us like it, the James went to because it's not stealing from okay, my children. Wait, wait, right? wait, wait. You just said earlier that it doesn't matter for your faith how old the, the universe is. Like you, you, seem, you seem to acknowledge that there are tons of like Christians that accept radiometric dates and evolution and the Big Bang and, and the scientific consensus. So if there's not a conflict there, then like, why is this so important? You said that you don't care about atoms because they don't contradict your faith. Why does radiometric dating contradict your faith? Because... Because there's so many discrepancies with it. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter. If radiometric dating worked, I like it doesn't matter. It, it would be so much easier. Work. Honestly, it would be so much easier to argue these debates if I just said the earth is old, right? It and would you be should. so much no, I know, but what I'm saying is the reason why I'm withdrawn from doing this is because of these discrepancies. All I want is clarification. All I want is to be able to prove it. But there's so much secrecy with this radiometric dating. There's so much, you know, you can't send anonymous samples. You can't, like you said, oh, they don't, they're not going to serve you. Why not? They'll serve me anything else I want. They have a $400 price feel, tag on the website. In, why do you feel so entitled that, like, 
radiometric <laughs> dating labs need to bend to you and they need to do labor for you. They, like they need to, they again, have the burden of proof. That's how it there works, are, right? There are so many peer reviewed published studies verifying the accuracy of radiometric dating. Like they do a blind sample. They send in a bunch of tree samples that all have dendrochronology, like to verify the age. They've tested the accuracy. I can send you study after study after study, verifying it, like comparing it to ice cores, comparing it to tree rings, comparing it to known history. Like there are like literally over probably two dozen studies I could send you that all verify the accuracy. Like, and, and some of it is like, um, like post, some of it is uh, pre like retrospective, prospective, blind. Like we can go through all these studies. Like this should be enough to show a reasonable person that radiometric dating is accurate. I don't know why you're so hung up on this idea that you specifically need to be able to send a sample or else it can't be relied upon. It, for me, that's what I'm saying for me. So these are organizations that are doing this, right? Like these are organizations that are sending these samples in. And I really have my doubts that they're no, sending not anonymous just, not samples. Not just organizations. <laughs> sorry. I, I, sorry to interrupt, but not just organizations. Like, like the one that does the big, like, you know, the, the, the fifth international radiocarbon, like all that, that that's an organization, but there are individual researchers like doing studies to test samples, blinded samples with radiometric labs for accuracy. And those are individuals. Those are not organizations. You know, maybe they work at an academic institution, but it's not like they're getting pressure from on high to do this. It's not the organization doing this. It's the individual researchers. So, and they're sending anonymous samples in yeah. and is this, this, so if they're not an organization, they're just researchers and they're sending anonymous samples. Is there a day a year that they open up and let people send their own personal money in to get things dated? Like, why won't they date artifacts for, for appraisals? That's the one thing that really gets me. Why won't they date an artifact for appraisal? It says right on the website, we don't date artifacts. We don't date appraisals. We don't date all these different things. If, if radiometric dating is such a silent, solid science and they can tell when things have been corrupted, why are they not dating appraisals so that people can value their possessions based on this? Even for organizations. Probably, even I for think organizations. probably a question of workflow. Like if you're an employee at one of these radiometric dating labs, like, I think that there's a certain priority that would go towards actual like scientific research and dating things that are going to be part of publications rather than just debate, like, like dating things that are given to you off the streets. I think like there's only a certain amount of time in the day. There's only a certain amount of lab hours that you're going to spend on this. And I think that there are priorities and I don't think that you could make a viable business model out of just doing like appraisals. Maybe I'm wrong with that. Maybe somebody will do that oh. in the future. I don't know, yeah, but that would like, make a I think that there are probably practical concerns on a day-to-day -day workflow level that would answer a lot of these problems you have. Ryan, do you know. how much longer do we have in the open discussion portion? Uh, honestly, yeah, I was only going to let it go for uh, maximum another 12 minutes. Uh, it seems like you guys are just uh, really rolling along here. This is uh, really awesome, honestly. Uh, so uh, how, how are you feeling, uh, Grayson? How you, how's it going? Um, I think we covered most of the topics that I necessarily wanted to cover. I mean, I don't know if there's anything that you felt that we left off the table, um, EOG. No, I mean, I, I did this debate before. I did have covered a lot of other stuff. I mean, touched on the some interesting stuff, so I'm good with it. I do got to okay. – can I run uh, – grab a drink really quick, Ryan, Is that if we're going into questions? No, you're not allowed – no, it's fine. I'm no. just joking around. Wait, but, Go ahead. Is that um, okay? Before you went there, there was actually one point. It's kind of extraneous to the flood, but you brought it up in the last flood debate that you did about the the pyramids and how they built the pyramids. Okay. Um, I, right. I don't know if you, if we had time to cover that really quick. We do. Go Just uh, hold Go your thought right quick. Let's let uh, Charles grab a drink right quick. No, it's okay. I, I can sure. wait till – yeah, we'll go for it. Okay. It'll be real quick, real quick. All right, go so ahead, like, Grayson. Like we do have – like evidence for how they built this pyramid. So I think that the reason it was brought up in the previous debate was that you were saying that, you know, we don't know what kind of technology Noah had yeah. available at the time. He could have had some sort of advanced technology that was used to build the ark or used in the ark. And then you, 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 for an example of the ancients having technology that we can't explain, you pointed to the pyramids. And I, I do think that in recent decades, we have explained how they built the pyramids. 
we do have evidence supporting it from the actual like quarries of where they got the rock, how they transported the rock over to where it needed to go on waterways, on massive barges, and how they transport it from one way to another with a series of ramps. Like you can I've watched I've watched all these. Some of these rocks are like 170,000 pounds. Some of them are are like enormously long. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. There's no way that these ramps and I watch it the way that they, they bring the ramp up and then they get the rope and they tie it around and they lift it and they turn it and then they put it down back on the boulders and they roll it back up to the next one, lift it up and turn it. I mean, it's impossible, man. One hundred and seventy thousand pounds wouldn't even be held by a rope, first of all. Second of all, they got to cut it out of the quarry and lift it up in the air. So they're using ropes to do that, too. And then they got to transport it hundreds of miles back to the pyramid site. Why would they do that? Why wouldn't they just build it beside the quarry if they were using rollers? Like nothing that the the I I completely disagree, man. I've watched so many things on how the pyramids were built, and I don't think there's any viable solutions. The one you're referencing was the latest one, and that's what the consensus is sticking with. But it still doesn't explain how they could lay. 170,000 pounds, 300 feet in the air with exact precision, set down beside each other. Like, there's no well, way that well, explains we, we it. We know where these stones were quarried. We we have the evidence to show where they were quarried from. And there are certain predictions that, that this method introduces. You say, well, look, it, there needs to be a waterway where they could transport this from the quarry system to the pyramid building site. And for a while, we didn't have evidence for that. But then, like, literally just a couple weeks ago, they found the actual uh, tributary arm of the Nile that went right from the quarry site to the, the Giza site where the pyramids were built. So there's a, you know, an actual prediction that was confirmed with evidence. You can have, like, there were depictions of them transporting these blocks in these ramps. And you have a reduction in the friction of coefficient by wetting the sand in front. And the type of sand that they were used... We've calculated the friction coefficients. We know how many people it would take to move each of these heavy blocks. Uh, I don't think that they're required to lift these blocks over the, like these ropes and put them on down. I mean, like through a series of ramps and enough people moving it, this can be accomplished. You can cut the stones with arsenical copper. Um, th there are known ancient methods of building this. And we see this across multiple ancient civilizations. When you asked why they would do this, because... For most of these ancient civilizations, you have an extremely hierarchical society where you have the political hierarchy and the religious hierarchy mixed in one. So these people are thinking that their entire afterlives are dependent on serving the political religious hierarchy of their civilization. Like we see this in Egypt, in Sumeria, in South America, in Mesoamerica, in China. Like we see these large scale building product projects that are directed by one or a few elite individuals. And then you have all these people, like a huge amount of people participating, moving massive amounts of earth and rock. This happens in every civilization. And it doesn't require any hyper advanced technology to explain the kinds of structures that they build. So, but if you've I, already I, heard I, all of this, I, the, the way you were talking yeah. made it sound like you, you hadn't heard of, no, I've, I've heard it. I, and I completely disagree, man. Like even the, the 170,000 pound stones are lifted in the, the main tomb and they're all like pillars on the roof and they're laid in with perfect precision. They're separated with perfect precision. I, I don't think that there's absolutely any way that uh, they moved these things with pulleys and ropes and people. It's, it's impossible. They have theories for how they did it because they have no other way to explain it. But the day that I can, see oh here we go again the day that i can see people lifting a hundred and seventy thousand pound stone 300 feet in the air with basic ropes chisels and hammers then i'll believe the pyramids but they don't build it right you, we you, don't have replicas of it it can be done saying, but we won't replicate it you you keep saying that they had to lift it 300 feet in the air again that's what the ramps are for they're not having to lift this stuff up in the air with ropes. they still had to lift them that's what i'm saying the main room in the tomb they are lifted in the air they're not rolled up onto the side they're lifted in the air and you even then that. even then even if they did bring all these there's millions of these stones even if they brought these stones you're telling me not one single stone broke and fell down the side there's no evidence they would have to go down and take out an entire section of the pyramid impossible just like these men with chisels and hammers just to repair we don't see any evidence of anything falling off the pyramid no damage 
coming down the side of the pyramid. There's no we evidence. Do actually, that. we do find broken pyramids where the bro the, the pyramid actually had to change it during construction. Part of it collapsed, and then they had to change the angle of the slope to finish off the pyramid. We do have some examples. of them are yeah. So the pyramids aren't like the ones like aren't like the pyramid of Giza. Around the world, they're not as complex as the pyramid of Giza. It's a completely different monster. The pyramid of Giza. There's some pretty amazing pyramids around the world lining up with suns. The way they build them are pretty intelligent a lot of technologies reflected from the pyramid of giza but nothing is like that structure that structure is is just the uh, the amount of weight that's put in there the precision of it the fact that there was no errors i mean i i just i don't buy it they can say that they did it with ropes and hammers and like we, we just went over but i mean they tried doing that there was i watched the thing where they tried building it and standing it up and they they couldn't get very far doing it. And the well, Egyptians say that it was done in what twenty years? Twenty years, right? Yeah, like, you can calculate you can calculate how many blocks would have to be moved each day. It's not an impossible yeah. amount. They it's had, like one stone every like ten minutes or something ridiculous. Yeah, and like they, that they had calculated. such a huge amount of people there. And we found where the workers were living. Like we we found where they were living. We know what kind of technology and diets that they had available, the workers. We actually see them writing things inside of the Pyramid of Giza saying, hey, this was moved by this worker gang. Hey, like here's our the name of our gang that we worked on. Like they literally named their little work crews and they like like put little graffiti signs inside the pyramids for like saying you know hey we're the we're the lovers of khufu this is our work gang like they're literally typing this so like we we have the statements i mean that could have been put there by we have the receipts man. like from the managers that were managing the workers we have the the receipts of how much they're paying them what supplies are coming in we have the actual managerial records during the building of the pyramids but we don't have any records on how they achieved it that's but the thing. These, these the things could have all... put, It's not like they're writing down. And today we did this thing this way. There's no blueprints or nothing. So need. we have no blueprints or nothing. We have the records of the people. Of course, people lived there. Of course, they did. We have the records of the meeting. Of course, they ate. Right. We have the records of them writing little things in the pyramid like, hey, we were here. Right. We have records of them paying their employees and everything. But the structure blueprints are gone. Right. Like, don't you find that ironic? Why would I find that ironic? Do, do is it? Do you need to have a written down like blueprint for the pyramid to do prove you, how that structure was built? Yeah, it would be nice because we can't figure out how it was built. That the way that they described it, I'm sorry, man. Like I don't understand why you can't see like like why a hundred and seventy thousand pound stone isn't going to be easily just rolled okay. up a ramp by some men with chisels and and little ropes yeah, I, that they I think made that from trees. You, when you phrase it like that, you're intentionally trying to frame it in a certain way that sounds impossible. But with enough manpower, you can move really, really heavy materials. Also, I'd point out that we don't have the blueprints for like the Roman Colosseum. Does, does that mean that the Romans had to use some sort of advanced technology to make it? No, we, we can look at the structure, how it is, and we can reason based on what we know about their building techniques and construction. We can we can piece together how they would have made the Colosseum. It's the same. It's a different the, monster, though, man. It's a it's a different the precision, the way it's lined up with the sky, the amount of boulders, the weight of the boulder or the amount of stones, the weight of the stones, the height that they're moved to, the precision that they're laid like not even you, air can get through the sections they're laid so close not one break in any of the millions of stones in those pyramids not one break along the sides that would show that something fell and they messed up so the actual like methodology explains how you have such close alignments and explains a lot like like if you take a, like a, a plumb bob on the equinox like it, it'll align east to west like very precisely and over the course of the day with enough plumb bobs of just straight little lines showing down, you can trace the shadows of them and that will give you perfectly straight lines exactly aligned with how the pyramids are. Like th these are primitive technologies that can replicate the precise results that you're talking about. 
So that's not that. Yeah. So it's lined up with the sun. That's not, I'm not saying that they lined it up with the sun is exciting. I'm saying the precision that they lined it up. These boulders with the sun is what's exciting. These things are enormously huge. They weigh enormous amounts of weight. They're laid with precision and they're matching the sky. Like it's wild when you put it all together. They, there's no way that primitive people did these technologies when they can can replicate it and they've tried it's funny they can't replicate these technologies they can't do them with manpower but they can talk a lot about how it's done with manpower but you don't see anybody pushing 170,000 pound stones up the pyramids or both ways they could do one section just to prove it could be done like that's something they would totally do and in, in to, to prove that technology they've been wondering that for centuries how those things were done thousands of years I definitely don't think that there's the funding and manpower to waste on like taking thousands of people moving these stones like up a ramp to build a section of a pyramid that took like 20 years and like literally like tens of thousands of people to do in the past. I don't really see that being very practical, but OK, we can. I, I, I personally, disagree. I think that I'm, absolutely. you're sort of I, all I'm getting back is a lot of personal incredulity like in the face no, like it's here's naturalistic explanations and mechanisms because it's not it. naturalistic you're dismissing the amount of weight that's being considered here i don't think you're considering how much weight 170,000 pounds is these are like how many guys do you think it would take to lift up a transport truck a fully loaded transport truck how many guys do you think it would take to do that and those are like 80,000 pounds max loaded mm -hmm. how many men is it going to take to climb that up 350 feet in the air like, I don't think people are really considering what's going on with these pyramids. Like, have you ever been there? Have you ever seen them? It's on my bucket list, but not it's, yet. Uh, mine too. I haven't seen them either. But everyone I talk to, they say the same. It's mind boggling. You, you're just overwhelmed with the size of these things. You look at pictures and they're just little guys standing there, right? Like beside these stones. Oh, I, I'm sure know, they're man. very impressive. There's no way they picked these things up. I don't buy it. And if they're going to say that humans are able even thousands of humans are able to pick up a hundred thousand pound transport truck i mean i don't know man show me i mean <laughs> you could definitely calculate how many humans that would take so that's an easily well, crunchable number like if I, there were actual do numbers that one day. to support what you're saying but it sounds like you just say i look at this and i just feel like humans could not do that with that level of technology but like I would because in my job, I, I deal with that kind of weight, man. That nobody's I've lifting. Seen calculations that. Nobody's lifting. Saying, that. I've seen calculations with like for this heavy of of a of an object at this degree of slope with this coefficient of friction, it would take this many people this long to move it into place. I've seen those calculations done, and they check out. All right. Uh, yeah. Well. Okay. I'll, I'll, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. No, I'll have to do the calculations, man. But I wholeheartedly disagree with you. And okay. I don't feel like I'm doing it on speculation or or yeah. personal feelings. I mean, weight is weight, man. Like, <laughs> All right. Well, I'll let you, you know, you can do a water break. I, I disagree. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. No good? worries. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll move into Q&A here shortly. Yeah, so I'll, I'll right do back. a Sorry. little bit of uh, housekeeping. So let me grab my imaginary broom here as I uh, dust up. Uh, Grayson, if you had anything you wanted to uh, do, if you wanted to take a washroom break, grab a drink, uh, feel free. Uh, so I will remind everybody that uh, uh, once again, we're going to move into uh, our Q&A. It does look like we've got uh, enough super chats that we will uh, stick to the super chats. If you have questions for either of our speakers, uh, you can get them in now. Uh, I do do see that we still have uh, over 300 people hanging out right now for the live stream and uh, just a little bit under 200 likes uh, so if you want me to put a real poll in the chat everybody not this nonsense BS poll that I just put in there uh, hit the like button and uh, we'll ask something fun um, Let's move into the polls, though, that I did ask earlier, and I'll let you know what our percentages were. So we had, did the flood of Noah happen? 69% of you voted no. 27% voted yes. So yes, for the Noah's flood. 69% no for the Noah's flood. And then 3% said, I'm figuring it out, uh, leaving 1% up in the air. So 1% disappeared on that poll. That's fine. Uh, we're not sure where you are. Where's our 1%? Oh, man. 
Bernie Sanders is going to have a breakdown over this poll. All right. Who is the most compelling speaker tonight was the second poll that we did. We had Grayson coming in at 78% and uh, Charles Evidence of God coming in at 21%. So uh, that that's a little juicy, but uh, that's that's just about, uh, about the subject there. And we don't take it too personally, but uh, uh, yeah, Grayson, Grayson's feeling pretty good about that. Maybe I should uh, reiterate, or maybe not when Charles gets back. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, either way, uh, we're having fun, and I hope you guys are in the live chat. So once again, hit the like button. We do have more debates coming up, so I don't know if you guys have hit the notification bell uh, for the debate that's coming up this weekend. Uh, so we do have, uh, does the Quran contradict science? Uh, and it's going to be a Hindu versus Muslim debate. Uh, so if you haven't already uh, hit the notification, that's going to be on Sunday. Uh, so uh, right now might be a good time to go hit the notification so you don't miss out on that. That's going to be a unique debate as far as uh, yeah. what we've seen on modern day debate uh, in recent history. Sure. Um, and we already did actually have uh, the debate uh on the channel here and james did host it um with our hindu speakers so if you are interested in maybe uh picking away at a different topic uh yeah go check that out and i definitely am gonna check that out i literally have since i've had my channel i've wanted to debate a hindu and a muslim and so far i have not found a hindu or a muslim to debate so i'm definitely gonna be checking that out that's a a niche that I've been wanting to hit. Well, let me just say, uh, just to uh, add to your uh, to your scratch there, it was against Daniel Hakikachu. Ah. Oh. <laughs> so I think you will have a lot of fun uh, with that Hindu versus Muslim debate. So let's carry into the Q&A, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I've got to move back into our chats uh evidence of god thanks for coming back uh yeah thank you can I, can I do a slight plug ryan before we move on to q a, a i just want to say that um i have been challenging witsit to do a flat earth debate for literal months now and he has been dodging me and dodging me and even this weekend james was trying to arrange that debate to happen and so far witsit has just completely ghosted so i like I've been in such a drought of debate of like finding people to debate. So I'm like super grateful for Charles for actually like having I the want... days to show up and do a debate. I've been like debate starved for months and I've been trying to get Witted to do it. And even James tried to get Witted to do it. So please, people in the audience, reach out to Witsit, get like shame him into doing this debate because I've been trying to make it happen for a, a, like months now since November since MDD con so <laughs> shame, come on let's make shame. it happen I'm calling out with I, it did I was I gonna say, say you guys had a pretty nice chat actually uh at debate con if I remember straight I was getting we talked I was getting we talked, pulled pork and I saw you guys sitting yeah. there having having with some and I each talked other. like in depth <laughs> for like 30 minutes in person where I'm talking about actual studies and actual like we're debating flat earth like right there but then when he wants when I when I challenge him to do it on stream I get crickets and he just totally ghosts me I, I've been messaging him all right, he doesn't all right. respond. it's <laughs> like what's going on here Come all right, on. can I, can, all right, Charles, I go ahead. can I add to that nope. yeah no I think that would be awesome to watch that debate I think uh uh what, what's it's he's he's good at what he does I think that would be a really good debate and um yeah, no, man. I, I'm thanks. I thanks for coming to the debate. I'd love to do like a debate on the Exodus or something else. Like yeah. James, when I first started debating, James was like, "Do the flood, do the flood." Um, so that's why you know. But there's a lot of things I'm gonna look into. Maybe another time I can come back with some of this stuff. But yeah. I'd love to do something on like another topic with you, man, because I've I've put a lot of research into a lot of other things. Yeah, and that would be I mean, it sounds good. I mean, honestly, like unlike some others that I won't name right now, I do actually think that you're like trying to engage with good faith here and you're not like you're not just trying to score rhetorical points to to yeah. make yourself look or sound good in the debate it sounds like you're actually trying to discuss and engage right. substantially, and yeah. i appreciate that a lot so yeah. i just want truth That's what, what i would do an exodus or a resurrection or an evolution or a big bang debate whatever cool cool man. see awesome. i told you in texas uh grayson you have to watch out for that canadian charm uh, <laughs> oh is, is yeah. he canadian i didn't even know sorry 
That's so <laughs> so, oh, yeah, there you go. Now you really. And by the way, for anybody that does want to debate me on any of those topics, normally on Thursday evenings, I do a live stream that's just like a call in. So anybody can join and debate me on any of these topics. So if you want to engage with me, you can always find me there. Awesome. Did you uh, did you want to do any quick plugs uh, as well? Evidence of God. I feel like that may be fair <laughs> before we move into our Q and A, and we'll give uh, our audience a chance to throw a few more uh, questions as, in there as I see that they are pouring in. So go ahead, Evidence of God. No, yeah, I mean I uh, my channel. I think I'm pretty sure is linked. Other than that, I don't got nothing. To plug. No worries. Oh, I got yeah. There's uh, another debate. Sorry, next next Saturday I'm doing a debate on the resurrection. I believe. Oh, I'm going to be watching. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and I will uh, – yeah, I'll give you your plug there. So Evidence of God is at Yahweh Science, Y-H, W-H, Science. Uh, so you can check that You're out. You're not supposed to pronounce it out loud, Ryan. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was the full – am I not supposed to say the full thing? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, you can... Get me in trouble. <laughs> do I have to scrub it now? I, I can do that after the video. It's fine. <laughs> Edited out. I edited out. Okay, I'll do what I can. Sorry, I edited out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Doctor Dino coming in with that first super chat. So thank you so much uh, to our super chatters, both EOG uh, first. One does a flood. What does a flood deposit look like? What does a flood deposit look like? I think that a flood deposit would look like exactly what we see. Um, the fossils laid down and covered up and the compression hardening the, the 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 fossils all together. I mean, exactly what we see is what I would expect a flood deposit to look like. Uh, different layers of rock, uh, sedimentary at the top. I mean, exactly what we see. That's what I would say. So, uh, yeah, Dr. Dino had followed up and said uh, – in a separate chat, uh, might want to have Grayson explain what Basilosaurus and Mosasaurus are before EOG answers. I'm so sorry. I, I missed the before part, <laughs> but you can go ahead there, Grayson, uh, if you want to clarify what uh, our super chat is asking. Yeah, so Basilosaurus and Mosasaurus are like two different types of animals that occupy a very similar ecological niche and look very similar in terms of like their overall appearance, size, density, all that kind of stuff. But the difference is that a basilosaurus is a, a mammal uh, from much more recently, and mosasaurs are marine reptiles from back in the Mesozoic period. So if a flood happened, you would expect for them to be found in the same layer because same habitat, same you know overall density, size, whatever, e everything that you could sort them by should be the same, but yet, they're found in totally different layers. Um, and if I was to describe what a, a flood deposit would, would look like, there are uh, six properties here. I have them written down that these are common general characteristics of mega flood deposits. So basal thick coarse parallel bedded units, large scale client forms, horizontally bedded thin laminated units, ripple and dune cross beds, silt beds and succession capping debris flow deposits. So like, those are the indications, those are the characteristics when we look at sedimentary layers. If they show those characteristics, those would indicate flood deposits. But when we look at the stratigraphic record more wholly, uh, we don't see that evidence of flood depositing. All right. Uh, so second part of this is uh, why, so this uh, would be for both of you, but of course I'll let you follow up evidence of God. Why are animals like Basilosaurus and Mosasaurus never found together? Uh, so I guess it's a follow-up. So did you want to think, comment on uh, <laughs> what Grayson yeah, just I, said? Yeah, I mean, I, I think talk. Grayson said it, right? One of them has lungs. Like, uh, that's what I said before, is is the buoyancy that is affected by the water, there's even the most minute differences are going to be um, attributed when the water is moving these things. And this is what we see with hydrological sorting. So that's why to say like different anatomies, everything makes a difference. The way it's laid um, is in accordance with the way it was preserved when it was killed or laying or whatever was happening. But one of those has water or sorry, lungs, and one of them doesn't. And that in itself explains a different buoyancy right off the bat. 
All right. Let's move on to the next uh, Super Chat, and thank you, everybody, and keep the Super Chats coming in. We appreciate them, and it'll keep the conversation rolling along and maybe touch on a new territory we haven't gotten to explore yet. Uh, Jesus Eber Martinez says, Moses saw people breaking a law they were not informed of and then said, Thou shall not kill, then told them to pick up a sword and kill each other. How does that make any sense? Yeah, thou, thou shall not kill is, is in reference to um, uh, like a cold blood. It's the same thing with Jesus, right? Jesus tells you not to hurt anybody, but he says it's the fool that goes to sleep when the thief's breaking in your house. Self-defense is is acceptable in in Christianity. I don't think that uh, I think that there's a lot of inconsistencies overall with the narrative. So th this is just one that I find to be a an inconsistency. So there's. There's lots that you could point to. <laughs> All right. Well, let's carry on. And thank you so much for your uh, super chat. Uh, we're going to move into Dr. Dino's second official super chat. The first geologists were all Christians. Many modern scientists are still devout Christians. Uh, Dr. Schweitzer and Baker. You don't have to be YEC. No, I agree. Uh, yeah, lots of people. Lots of uh, people are Christians. The first scientists were majority, uh, majority Christians. Um, yeah, and you don't have to be a young Earth creationist. I, I explained why I believe that the, that the Earth is most probably that situation, just because of the discrepancies that we see. So uh, I have no reason to accept evidence that I feel like can't be proved to me uh, when it contradicts the evidence that I observe. But there's a lot of things I'm going to take into account today and I'm going to go over it and look at it and hopefully I'll come back with something and or consider it. Right. I feel like you keep gesturing to these discrepancies in radiometric dating, but I don't feel like we ever actually got to substantively engage in the debate with any of these discrepancies, like to actually chew on and go back and forth on. I feel like you, you kept saying that there are all these discrepancies, but we never actually got to discuss them. I mean, was well, there like anything the we covered? Like the, yeah, like the different dates in individual rocks and the times that samples show up different, uh, samples come up wrong, uh, prove themselves wrong with the contents and the columns, and it's just brushed off as corruption, right? Every time a date is wrong, it's just acceptable that it's corruption. But every time they feel a date is right, it's acceptable that it's right. These are discrepancies that we see throughout uh, radiometric dating. I, is contamination really so, like... But why? how do we know everything's not contaminated, if that's the case? If we can accept that a rock is a certain age until the geological column gives us a reason to think otherwise, how can we accept anything at that point? That's because you can, like, for the example of zircon crystals, right, you can see if there's been contamination in the crystal. If that crystal structure is cracked or partially melted, you can see the evidence that the contamination has happened. You wouldn't use that as a sample. When you look at pristine zircon crystals, you don't see what you're talking about with these discrepancies. Like, it's weird, right? If the Earth is not 4.5 billion years old, then why is it that when we look at zircon crystal dating, all the ages you can find, you know, some that are 3 billion, some that are 3.8, some that are 4.2, 4.5, but you never find 4.8. You never find 5 billion. You never get a result that's 7 billion years. They all just cap at 4.5 billion years. Like, that would be so weird of a coincidence if it's not actually telling you something about the world. But until, so the earth was also, like, it's been growing. I think now they're saying that, uh, the age of the earth was it the age of the earth or the universe these are constantly changing these ages right they're not they're so, really not <laughs> but like, but they they have been changing through history the age of the universe and then they just found something that they dated i think it was the age of the earth they, they just upped the age of the earth right they just found something and they're questioning it or maybe it was no. the universe a meteor or something it jumped it but it, they keep the thing I see headlines for that, but that 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 never actually is a thing. Like there's today, like today, but tomorrow it very well probably will be, right? The dates keep climbing up and getting bigger and bigger. And when the day if the earth turns out that it's seven billion years, I'm sure then we'll start finding these crystals that are, you know, six point five billion, and then you'll be laughing at that. You'll be like, I think it's weird that we're not finding anything beyond seven. And well, so that's, on and that's so a forth, very right? speculative hypothetical. 
For sure. But you see what I'm saying, right? Like you would be doing the same thing had that been the case, right? Look, like <laughs> everything that is knowledge that we've learned in science is subject to change. It's predicated on new data that comes out. If new data comes out and makes you change what you knew, then that's the advantage of science. You can change with new data. But like if you're just saying that, like you're saying, well, in the future, this new data will come out and it will change. I mean, that that's just speculation. I can't really engage with that, like with that, because that data does not exist at the moment. No, I'm not saying that it's going to come out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if it did, you would accept it. Right. And it's the same thing with the crystals. Right. You're saying that's the thing. Science is always changing and everything's always changing. And we have no problem saying that when it's, you know, trying to consider out, consider the Big Bang and, you know, how energy created everything. Well, someday we'll sort it out how nothing's happened. Right. Like, that's fine to say that. But then when we turn around and we use that same idea against something that's involved in the mainstream narrative, all of a sudden it's well now you're just being speculative right like as the, as the was, universe that was too ambiguous for me to be even able to track what you were talking about i'm not sure i picked up what you were saying but we can move on i guess I don't... okay <laughs> All right, you guys got it. Let us carry on. And thank you so much uh, once again for all the super chats. And uh, let me just pop those back open uh, as I've been hanging out with the live chat while you guys have been uh, wrapping up your thoughts there. And honestly, uh, once again, what a great discussion between our two speakers. Uh, check them out in their spaces, uh, respectively. And uh, let's see. Dr. Dino following up says Dr. Schweitzer was fearful of challenging the consensus. She was cautious and tried to disprove her initial hypothesis like a good scientist. Yeah, because she came up to her teacher and that's what she came up to her teacher and she said, this can't be. And he said, we'll disprove it. That's what she says in her interview. But they never questioned the dates. That's the point. Never once were, were the dates questioned. She never tried to, tried to disprove the dates, ever. Because there's already such a copious amount of evidence on the other side that would have to be overcome. For her to disprove those dates, she would have to overcome so much evidence showing those dates, cross-corroborating those dates. Like, that, I don't even know how you would begin to disprove that weight of evidence like there are hundreds of different radiometric dating samples that cross corroborate to give the dates that we have in the consensus model i know but then like collagen shows up that's supposedly 85 million years old and we know this is and now they find these types of things in all kinds of different dinosaur bones right by doing the same process so this is showing that like that's a far stretch of the imagination to assume something can survive and they still don't fully understand and like you said perhaps one oh, day they will and perhaps one that, day it'll make sense i think we do actually understand how that they say the minerals are preserving it but i mean it's just it's speculation right well, when, but, it's not just speculation like when you actually look at the biochemical structure of the collagen that she was finding in these fossils this is not like living collagen it's highly fragmented there's a ton of disulfide bridges between them that like like within the actual molecular structure of the of the collagen and those disulfide bridges stabilize it it's surrounded by iron atoms which also have a stabilizing effect like you can actually see mechanistically why that collagen would be lasting so long in those conditions and you can see the effects that it's had on it on a molecular uh, on a molecular scale you can see the effects of that aging a long time 85 minutes Let's move to the next question. And we are only 27 likes away from uh, the goal I set. So uh, if you guys don't have lazy thumbs, uh, let's see if we can uh, uh, get up to our, our our meter there, if you will. Uh, Sunflower says, oh, hey, Sunflower. Haven't seen you in a little while. Uh, glad to see you hanging out in the live chat. Nuclear weapons have inflated a C-14 such that objects post 1960s can't be accurately dated. What if nuclear weapons were used by an ancient civilization? You would see evidence that they had used nuclear weapons. You, you could see evidence of nuclear weapons being used to such a degree that it would change the atmospheric composition of the Earth. You could, you could see the evidence for our nuclear testing you, you could see this geologically. You could see the radioactive results from this. Like, there would be evidence that that had occurred. 
Okay. Any thoughts on the other side? I mean, yeah, perhaps. I don't know. I don't have any reason to think that. But I mean, I suppose you could do it. I don't know. That's a good question. Oh, no worries. Well, let's uh, let's carry on. And uh, thank you again, Sunflower, for your super chat. And I see a couple more have come in. So uh, thank you to our speakers for humoring a few extra chats that are coming that are coming in. Uh, and if you've got any questions, uh, we are still taking super chats uh, until one of our speakers puts up their hands, protests. No, no, no. I've had enough. I've got to go to bed. All right. Unless it's me. All right. Doctor <laughs> Dino says we've. We've dated Mount Vesuvius. Vesuvius? You can correct Vesuvius. me. Vesuvius. Vesuvius, thank you. Uh, with a C14 and AR AR2, the year, the YR. Is that what he means? I'm not sure. Dr. Yeah, he's, he's talking about Mount Vesuvius, which was the volcanic eruption that buried Pompeii, very famous in Roman history. It erupted in, I believe, 79 AD, and it has been radiometrically dated using like argon dating and radiocarbon dating that both agree and give the same date that I think is within around 11 or 15 years of the historical date that we know this occurred. Okay. Any thoughts again, on the other I, again, I mean, they, they knew the date when they took the samples and there's a lot of, again, I, I take it back to there's a lot of issues there. You know, there is a lot of issues. with these. Would you agree that there's methodological things that you can do in your experimental design that control for such biases? Like, you know, you could blind your results. So you don't know um, what year that your data is giving until after you've already done all your necessary calculations. Like there are ways of getting around the kind of bias that you're expressing. And I think that we can see in the data that there isn't this systematic bias. And the testing of Mount Vesuvius has been repeated in the time period since the original um, radiometric datings have been have been done. This has been done by multiple different teams, and they get around the same results. I can this, give you studies if you want. Yeah, and the samples that were submitted, though, they 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 knew the date going in, right? If, if they were blind, then the then the labs didn't know what they were testing. They they weren't aware that they were, were testing. Were the labs blind or were they handed the samples and said this is from uh, Pompeii? Eruption? Uh, I don't, I wouldn't be able to say authoritatively in this example, but I can link you several studies that do sample test Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii data and Heraklion and, and the, the surrounding areas. Um, and we can see if those samples were blinded in their experimental setup. All right. I'll let us carry on. And thank you uh, again for uh, clarifying and going through the questions so thoroughly. And uh, let's see, Dr. Dino coming in with another one saying, paying for Grayson to plug my fundraiser. Link <laughs> sent. All right. What's right. going on with that, Grayson? Uh, he's paying for this. So, yes. uh, Dr. So, Dino, I don't mind. Big shout out to Dr. Dino. Um, he's a, a an early career paleontologist who has a YouTube channel. Um, he does a lot of cool dinosaur content, and he was actually kind enough to let me tag along on his dinosaur fossil dig that he's going on later on this month in Wyoming. He's letting me fulfill a childhood dream of mine and come with him to actually dig for some dinosaur bones. So I don't know if, uh, you know, I'm sure that on his channel, there's the link to the fundraising. He's he's trying to raise funds so that we could be sure to find this dinosaur fossil specimen. He's been working on a humerus bone of a juvenile sauropod that was unearthed in the 1960s, but is so far unidentified for what species it is. And we just have the one bone to go off of. So he's named it Lentil. And this summer, we are going to be going back to Wyoming to find, hopefully find, the rest of Lentil and find the full specimen and get an actual species identification. So. If you like paleontology, if you like adventures, and you, you want to find the rest of Lentil like we do, then definitely check out Dr. Dino's channel and consider uh, contributing to that fundraising. Because, yeah, like I said, childhood dream of mine to dig up a dinosaur fossil. So I'm really, really hoping that we have some luck uh, later on this month. That does sound like a lot of fun. And I'm sorry to cut you off just because uh, uh, 
yeah, honestly, yeah, that does sound like a good time. And uh, I'll try to get through uh, to the next super chat just because I know uh, Evidence of God doesn't really uh, probably have too much he can follow up with with that question. <laughs> but uh, that, yeah, once again, uh, yeah, if you need any, uh, you need any third tag alongs. No, I'm just joking with you. You know, I'm too busy with the kids and all that. Uh, well, it's going to be a busy summer, sailing lessons, all that stuff. You know, it's going to be oh, nice. dad life hardcore. It's, I'm going to be tired. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, honestly, Dr. Dino, I'd love to get you on here for uh, a debate. Uh, yeah, just uh, let me know when you guys are back, settled, and we'll, uh, we'll chat. Jesus Eber uh, Martinez coming in with another question saying, uh, with Moses, uh, this was not self-defense. Moses said to kill those who worshipped the golden calf. Who did Moses order to kill each other? Yeah, so the the Old Testament is based is, is the survival of the Jews. There was a lot of stuff going on back then in the Old Testament. Uh, I'm not sure why the, this question keeps coming up in this debate, but I'll explain it. Uh, it's all about the survival of the Jews. And if you go and you read these things, a lot of the societal things that they were doing, much like witches, like I do videos on this, uh, the witches uh, were a lot different than, you know, my crazy aunt in the basement with some music you know like they were detrimental to the society so a lot of people they did a lot of violent things and a lot of people died um but it was there was purpose to it in the old testament they didn't have police they didn't have places to run to they had to deal with things and so was yeah well i don't know i'm not gonna try to do apologia for like the genocide of the canaanites because it wasn't just that they're causing was self problems, right? The, the order was to kill all the men, women, and children, and animals. Like, you can't just say, oh, well, some of them are witches. Like, we're talking about innocent children and, like, farm animals. Like, that's not detrimental to the society. There's not, like, cow witches that are going to be damaging to Jewish society. It's not about survival to go kill all the women and children and animals of the Canaanites. Like, that was an issue an order commanded by a supposedly omnibenevolent God. Like it just does not compute to me. Yeah. Can I respond to that? Sure thing. Yeah. So he was referring to the golden calf people amongst their own society. As far as the Canaanites, uh, what they did there, uh, the different tribes, like the uh, Amalekites, it, it was self-defense. If you read the, the Bible, these people were constantly generationally attacking them, enslaving them, killing them. The wiping out of the Canaanites was completely self-defense. The Canaanites, uh, there's a list of incestual breeding that they did. They were very close incestual breeders. Um, and and so were the probably so were the animals uh they they wiped them out it's sad that it happened and a lot of people say it's eugenics but to be honest with you if god didn't wipe out tribes that were breeding with their siblings and forcing other tribes back in that day to be subservient and wiping out their genetics today would be a much different world full of very scary and weird things so i mean you can blame god and say he was violent but really you're thankful for what moses and them did in that era for the life and existence we have well, today. <laughs> no, I'm not. There, there, there's be no, no science. There's There'd no self-defense no against killing children, right? You're not killing children out of self-defense. That And yeah. babies, like babies and farm yeah. animals. It's not like the Canaanite farm animals are going to hold a grudge against you and try to take revenge. Like, no, I, I don't buy that it's self-defense. Like if it was only killing the Canaanite warriors or like the, the diehard zealot Canaanites, okay, you might have an argument there, but for killing children and babies and animals, it don't add up that way. And even in the Bible, after God commands this, after the conquests of Joshua and everything, then you get to the next part of the of the narrative, and the Canaanites show back up. It's not yeah, like they they're... were wiped out. They're, they're still there afterwards. So that it, yeah, none yeah. of it had any point at all. The Canaanites were branches of lots of tribes, like even the Israelites, a lot of them came from the Canaanites. When it refers to the Canaanites, yes. there's lots of tribes underneath it. And the, the Bible explains that through history, the children kept growing up and they would come back. They actually let these guys go many times throughout the Bible. It wasn't until they got big enough and strong enough that they couldn't defeat them, that they had to finally wipe them out. And yes, they killed the children and they killed those people. And that's sad and unfortunate. But at the same time, history showed 
It's like it's like going to Nazi Germany. Sorry to take it back to that, but would you have a problem going in and fighting the the Germans in that scenario? Right? They these people kept coming. They knew they were going to keep coming. Right? If a kid's holding a rifle at you, are you going to walk away? Right? You got to do what you got to do. It's a very sad situation, but everything in that scenario shows it was self defense. They attacked the Israelites constantly. So I do have an issue with killing innocents. Like the commands that God gives in Exodus are to kill innocents, like even the babies, the infants. If we went into Nazi Germany and started killing babies, yes, I would have a problem with that. But what if the if the baby, so if, if a group of people, so if you were in a tribe years ago, many years ago, no police, no nothing like that, and a group of people kept coming into your village and killing people, taking your women, taking your children, enslaving them, doing whatever they wanted, and then they would take go, go back, you'd fight them off, then they would grow up the children, and those children were strong enough, and they would come back and do it again. You'd fight them off, and those children would grow up and strong enough and come back. And, that's what was going on in the Bible. That's what it describes. So, yes, they wiped out those children. It was sad. It was unfortunate. But history proved to them that those children were indeed a threat. They were not a threat as children. It's sad, but they were 100 percent going to grow up and attack the Israelites. And God said, you won't be able to defeat them. You got to stop. That's Personally, I think about. that an omnibenevolent God would probably tell his people to adopt those babies instead of killing them and show them love to have them change their ways. I think that a God that's all about love would probably go with the approach that highlights love instead of infanticide. That's my personal take. Could have all done right. it that way. Well, with that, I think we will go into our one minute closing thoughts on our discussion tonight uh, we did traverse quite a bit of territory our open discussion lasted you know about 40 minutes longer than we generally go maybe a half hour you know I might be exaggerating so uh, Grayson uh, I'll give you one minute uh, to uh, make your closing statement uh, thoughts on discussion tonight where everybody can find you and other discussions you'd like to have in the future um yeah, I thought that this was a good discussion. Like you said, we covered a lot of ground. Hopefully my opponent tonight like listens back or reflects on some of my arguments or maybe asks me for some citations or something so that we can continue the dialogue because I think that a lot of the points that I brought up are preclusionary to a flood being possible. Like at least a flood that is responsible for all of the geological layers that we see in the earth. I think that it has been precluded by the evidence that I've, I've presented so far tonight. But I thought we had a good discussion. We weren't just trying to score rhetorical points. I, I think that we were actually engaging with the subject. Um, and then, yeah, my channel is based theory, as in a well-based theory or the opposite of a cringe hypothesis like Noah's Flood. And, yeah, I do uh, debates like this. A lot on my channel for a lot of different subjects from science, pseudoscience, religion, everything in between. Um, and then I do those weekly streams where people can call in and debate. I might do one after this. It just kind of depends on how much energy that I have, um, whether. But yeah, just keep an eye on my channel because I let anybody call in and, and debate. Maybe that's a foolish, a fool's errand to just let anybody on. But so far, I've had a lot of really fun and interesting conversations every Thursday evening. So yeah, exactly. if you if you want to engage with me, if you think that I'm full of it and you think that you can poke holes in my arguments, please, the, the gauntlet is throw down. You're welcome on. All right. You heard it out here at uh, Modern Day Debate. Grayson is uh, crying out to the interwebs. Uh, if you want to debate, you can find him in his space there. Uh, he's going to be tagged in our description. We do have a one last uh, super chat that came in. So uh, let's bounce this one back and forth and then I'll give you the uh, closing statement there. Uh, Jesus Martinez coming in with the last one. At the base of Mount Sinai, Moses ordered the good Israelites to kill the quote unquote bad Israelites that were worship to the golden calf not other tribes each other so i'll uh, hand that over to you evidence of god i think he's responding to uh, uh your last response there yeah i just i, I just uh, addressed that that's like what, what i was getting at with the witches right if the bible describes these things as like um they were the the pagans were really dangerous they worshiped uh, multiple things so when they were worshiping the cow they were leading to paganism uh the pagans were responsible for killing their children uh putting their own children through the fire they did things like ancestral breeding uh genocides killing um the bible is about 
uh, self-defense. It's about the preserv preservation of the Israelite lineage. That's what the Old Testament is about. Um, so, yeah, they killed certain Israelites amongst the tribes that left the faith and embraced paganism. Did you That's want a chance to respond there, Grayson? I think that the problem of evil is a pretty exclusionary issue for a Christian conception of God. Like being omnibenevolent, omniscient, and omnipotent. I don't think that you can square that with the problem of evil. Many philosophers over many generations have tried, but I think instances like this of God commanding acts that would seem to be pretty evil... And just the fact that evil exists in the world, even though he has the power to have created people with the free will to not choose evil. Uh, I think there's a lot of philosophical issues on it, but I'll just leave it at that. All right, you got it. Uh, did you have any closing thoughts there, uh, evidence uh, of God, on the question before yeah. you get your one minute? Oh, um, uh, no, I think that, I don't know, I'd, I'd love to talk about this more with you sometime, Grayson, but uh, I think it's a whole other topic, but... I think uh, the, the Bible is justified in what it did. I, I do think that the Old Testament makes sense. All right. Well, uh, yeah, before we do the one minute, uh, I will say thank you to everybody in our live chat for your super chats. We're going to close it there. Uh, and, and Jesus, no problem. I see that uh, you said thanks for fitting me in at the end. Uh, no worries. Uh, we appreciate your support, uh, like I said, along with everybody else. So uh, let's do one minute on the floor. Evidence of God. It is yours. Awesome. Yeah, no, I just want to say thanks uh, to Modern Day Debates. Thanks, Grayson. And uh, thanks, everyone, for <laughs> you got your name as James today, right? I just noticed that. Oh, in the Zoom <laughs> chat? Always. Yeah, always James. I don't bother changing it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I just want to say thank you. It was a good discussion. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that he brought, and I'm going to look it up, and uh, maybe I can think about some stuff for it and kind of rectify it, and maybe we can have another discussion sometime about it. But I'd love to do the Exodus or, or problem of evil or sometime with you. That'd be fun. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we can get you guys versus each other, or maybe we can even have a panel discussion. Uh, you know, definitely. Uh, let's chit chat. Uh, I've got a little bit of extra extra time here to uh, perhaps plan that stuff out. So just uh, hit me up and. Uh, yeah, thanks again. A uh, big round of virtual applause to uh, Grayson and Evidence of God. 